This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode number 371, recorded on January 8th, 2016. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello. And you are listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today here in the TWIV studio, Dixon de Pommier. Good afternoon, Vincent. I have not seen you on TWIV for a month. Is that right? It's last two episodes, I'm afraid. That's true. Three episodes. More. Three. I haven't been here in a long time. I've been a w o l. You've been traveling, right? Yeah, I've been to Costa Rica with my wife on vacation. You're on vacation every day. <laughs> oh, this sorry. Is probably right. <laughs> uh, it is, uh, let's see, very cloudy here in New York. Yeah, it's completely It's warmed up, over. though, five degrees Celsius. How about that? Went above freezing. Clouds it's will do that for you. Going up to 10 degrees today. Did you know that? What's that? Clouds actually trap the heat. Even in the absence of sun? No, they had sun first. Okay. But, uh, the sun doesn't bounce back into space because the clouds are Got there. it. I understand that. Also joining us from... Southeastern Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. How, How are, are you? you? Happy New Year, everybody, by Happy the way. Year. Yeah. Uh, and doing you. great. It's 38 degrees Fahrenheit and it's raining. Mm -hmm. That's three degrees Celsius. By the time we finish recording, it might even be snowing because different weather apps say that it's already colder now and that it'll be 31 by four o'clock when it's supposed to still be raining. Wow. Kind of na nasty. Might it, be freezing rain. Looks in. Don't move your mic around. It's very audible. Okay? The I'm spring noise. To be good. Just leave it alone. Really Put your hands underneath your thighs. Okay? <laughs> and don't move them. Also joining us from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. And I'm putting my hands in the air like I just don't care. <laughs> What's that from? <laughs> it's, it's a song. <laughs> take my wallet. Don't take my life. <laughs> my hands in the air like I just don't care. Do you have uh, cloudy weather there in Western? Yes, Miami? it's uh, it's overcast, uh, four Celsius, and uh, uh, supposed to get wintry mix. Everybody's favorite form of precipitation. <laughs> wintry mix. <laughs> yeah. Is that like a trail mix? Uh, it it, it is a lot less pleasant than a trail mix. <laughs> right. And then we may even get freezing fog at some point. That's oh, always a fun one. This is our first TWIV of 2016. Happy New Year to all of our listeners. And we will have 51 more of these this year, at least, maybe more. And um, hope it's a great year for everybody. Thanks for staying with us. By the way, Rich Condit should be joining us, uh, I don't know, within a half hour. He's traveling, right? Mm -hmm. Returning home. From Oregon. Mm -hmm. Sun, Sun City, is that what the name of it is? Sun Valley? Sun, Sun Crater, Sun Canyon. <laughs> Sun River. Sun River. Sun River. <laughs> Sun River is in Going through the Montana. geological things here. It's the opposite of Moon River. <laughs> Moon River. Oh, but wonderful. We had, I had an email from uh, our friend Jim in Virginia. Apparently it was Frank Sinatra's birthday in December. Yeah, it was. That's and they true. did, yeah. some radio did a... A hundred song playlist. Compilation, yeah. And he sent it to me because he knows my daughter yeah. likes. I have to say, I I am a big fan of Frank Sinatra's Holiday album, which is quite old. And um, when well, I was Frank young... Frank Sinatra is no spring chicken. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> when I was young, my father used to listen to this. Ah. And I just like the songs, you know. I'm, I just think he's got a great voice. Uh -huh. He's got... for The first side, the A side, is... Um, Modern versions, modern Christmas carols, and the B side are the, the traditional religious ones. I really like the A side. Huh. And there's one uh, song where at the end he just speaks in his voice, Merry Christmas, in that Hoboken accent. It's so funny. <laughs> if you've ever heard it, it's really fun. This episode of TWIV is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology Grant Writing Institute Online Webinar. You got all that? Yep. It is. So apparently it's going to be a webinar online, so you can stay wherever you are and take this. And Most you, webinars are online. Yes, they are. 
That's the whole point, right? Amazing right. observation. So online is redundant in this, right? It, it, it is, yes. But <laughs> you guys are going to wordsmith every ad. We'll never have. To <laughs> we'll never get another advertiser. Sorry, ASM. No, no. Seriously, it's, it sounds like an excellent. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, you're right. We shouldn't. <laughs> I'm sorry. I want to get it right. I'm going to take the online out. Okay, backspace. I love it. Well, anyway. I, I would leave it in because it's actually part of the Bitly address that you've got here. Yeah, you're right. There's right, an opening there. In. Graduate student postdocs and early career scientists, which is not you and me, Dixon. No. Nor Kathy, nor Alan. No. no. Uh, are invited to apply for the ASM Grant Writing Institute online webinar series. What is this all about? Well, you're going to get an overview of the Grant Writing Enterprise. The Spaceship Enterprise, the Grant Writing Enterprise. Mm -hmm. Topics include discussions of writing NIH, NSF grants, and taking a look at grants from the reviewer's perspective. Oh, my. Because mm, that's important, right? Because right. that is, in the end, who scores them. You need to understand your audience. You need to, absolutely. I've heard that so many times this week. I listened to a podcast by a guy who has the Horse Radio Network. <laughs> he has podcasts, like 12 of them, about horses. And he kept saying, I know my audience. I know my audience. Uh, it is a six-part series, by the way. March through June of 2016. The important part is the application deadline, February 10th, all right? About a month away. And there is a website, of course, bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y slash A-S-M-G-W-O 16. That's all one word, lowercase letters. I'll say it again for all of you. Of course, you can also find it at the website bit.ly slash asmgwo16 grant writing institute webinar could be cool you know i'd do this that it sounds like a really good idea because grant writing is uh, a crucial part of the job especially if you're earlier in your career yep you bet i look at ba back at my early grants and and it was in a time when <coughs> it was relatively easy to obtain funding and i cringe when i look at them because <laughs> they're so horrible. And, and over the years, I got better at it, which is not something, uh, it's intuitive. You uh, Having a course like this is good. Uh, right, because the, the old trial and error method was fine when funding was relatively easy yeah. to get. You know, right. you missed a grant, you got a grant. <clears throat> now you miss a grant, you're, you're out of work. Exactly. Right. And speaking of sponsors, we thank ASM, of course, for their support of TWIV and other... Uh, podcast in the Microbe TV network. If you're interested in sponsoring one of our podcasts, TWIV, TWIP, TWIM, Urban Agriculture, TWIVO, you can find them all at microbe.tv. We have thousands and thousands of listeners who love science. It is a focused audience. If you have a product that you think they will like, send us an email to sponsor at microbe.tv. We have reasonable rates. Um, one thing I would like to ask everyone, if you have an idea for another Principles of Virology giveaway contest, let me know. Mm -hmm. Something unusual. I can come up with another How one, many different uh, methods for viral replication are there? Yeah, this is too easy. To <laughs> We're going to have 100. Right, everybody I, know turn in an I know the answer. <laughs> um, anyway, we had two giveaways, Dixon, a Twitter, a Twitter giveaway and an email giveaway. Yeah. and. The first winner finally contacted me, and she's very excited. And the second winner, which we announced last time, has not yet contacted us. Uh -huh. So I'm just, you know, going to wait and see how long it takes. <laughs> I did that with the first one. It was only one episode. I guess it's kind of uh, nasty, but not really. I just want to see how long it takes between the yeah. message and receiving it. All right, we have some follow-up today from Anthony he sends us a link to an article in a uh, on a website called independentliving.org, promoting the self-determination of people with disabilities. And this is about um, microcephaly. And the summary is, for well over 100 years, microcephaly in South Asia has been more frequent than elsewhere, though often thought to be caused by abuse. Investigation has shown has not shown that to be so. A genetic cause is often mentioned. Might microcephaly in South Asia actually be due to a virus? And of course, this is a tie-in to the Zika virus yeah. episode a few episodes back. And you know, so, so microcephaly has been around for a while, 
And uh, maybe all well, that time it was viral. Who knows? So anyway, check out the article. Thank you, Anthony. Oh. Uh, um, Kathy, want to take the next one? Sure. This is from... Josephine. Josephine. Right. Okay. Dear Twivologists, first, a huge thanks for this and all the Twiv podcasts. I'm looking forward to more of the latest in the Twix family of podcasts. I am usually one of those listeners who rarely, if ever, steps out of the background. I've listened to every single podcast of the (laughs) Twix family, some more than once, and also to Urban Agriculture. They are superb. Wow. Ah, That's quite a record. Yeah. My New Year's resolution was to send in a letter to TWIV to express my appreciation for your efforts. You have provided me with many hours of enjoyable learning, like having my own personal portable journal club. I thought you might enjoy a painting that my husband, (laughs) George Cush, did a number of years ago as West Nile virus was spreading across North America. Usually the subject matter of his art is Western Canadian frontier, American Civil War, and American Indian War periods. On this occasion, he strayed from these themes and touched a bit on virology. Best regards, Josephine. And then she sent along this image. And <laughs> right? it's beautiful. It is. It's cool. It's great. Yeah. It's lovely. It's just it lovely. is great. It, it, it actually touches on some of those other themes as well as virology. Yes. Yeah. Yes, it's, it's Native American <laughs> and West and Egypt and exactly. yes. Yeah. I love that the gentleman is, he's got a bow and he's pulling back the arrow. And he's aiming at a mosquito. I mean, a mosquito. And if he yeah. misses, of course, the horse dies. The horse it looks, right. It looks like it's going to go right. But he won't miss, Dixon. He will not miss. However, not at that rate. Even if he hits the mosquito, I think it That's will right. keep going. That's right. right. And the katush at the side is very, very well done mm-hmm. as well. Yes. What's a katush, Dixon? It's a series of hieroglyphs which describe things. So what like, do you think that says? Uh, it says West Nile virus is mostly a disease of crows or birds. Uh, you can catch it by injection. It uh, got uh, water breeding sites for the mosquitoes in there. What's the little black thing? On That's the, a good question. Looks like an umbrella. Right. Yeah. That's hard to figure out. I can't see it. I'm not sure. Mm. Anyway, it's gorgeous. Thank you so much, Josephine and George. And what a fan. Every episode. It's amazing. Yeah. Thank you for your praise. We appreciate it. Yes. And of course, I couldn't do that without all of my wonderful co-hosts on all of these podcasts. So they're great that they do this and uh, put up with all this. I've <laughs> blown up the image. Yes. It looks a little like a some kind of tall flower. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it could be. Flower. With the yeah. leaves at the bottom. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Well, she'll just have to write back. Yes. Indeed. Tell us exactly Indeed. what it is. Alan, can you take Fernando's? Sure. Fernando um, sends a link. <clears throat> and this is uh, regarding turtles all the way down. So, hi, Twiv Aces. I found your discussion of the JNK paper fascinating, but even with the excellent additional details that Kathy, thanks Kathy, got from the lead author, it was really hard to keep track of the various constituents of the relevant pathways and their positive activation and negative inhibition relationships. I've struggled with this with other papers you discussed before. I wonder if it would be possible for the team to just sketch a drawing with the names or abbreviations of the various pathway elements and arrows marked with plus for activation and minus for inhibition, linking them appropriately, scan it, and add it to the show notes. I suspect it would not be so difficult to do while reading the source paper and preparing notes for the show, but unfortunately this paper is not open access, so I can't try to do this myself. Um, And Fernando, actually, yes, that's something that I commonly do when I'm reading a paper like this, because I absolutely cannot keep track of all this stuff (laughs) without a picture. Uh, But in this case, we have... um, well, actually, let me do the PSs first, and then we'll get to uh, your bit, Kathy, right? Right. Um, so, uh, PS1, regarding the text mining letter and your question about PLOS's text mining policies, see this link, uh, gives a link, uh, quoting, Furthermore, PLOS is one of the few publishers who enable and encourage text mining research by providing an open API to mine our journal content. Good. Yes. PS2, Kathy. Thanks for the Google Ngram viewer. Some of its advanced features were developed by my team at Google. Mm-hmm. In particular, you can try <laughs> queries like quote star underscore capital ADJ space virus end quote or quote virus uh, star underscore capitals noun end quote to get relative frequencies for different ways virus is described or qualified in the corpus. Mm-hmm. And that's very cool. Mm-hmm. I didn't know he was at Google. Yeah. All right. I'm surprised he can't get journal articles. 
Right. <laughs> you can get them all. Trust they should me. know everything. <laughs> now, um, Kathy, you had some follow-up on this, responding to this letter. Right. So, Fernando asked if we could have provided or could provide a diagram with the pathways and the elements. And I had done one in the paper, in the margin of the paper, as I read Anna's paper. <laughs> and so, I recopied that, made it nicer, and sent it to her and said, but you may already have some slide that you show in talks and things. And so she sent back a diagram that uh, she had. Um, and so she wrote, you guys all did a really good job of discussing the paper. Thank you for featuring it on the show. I'm attaching a diagram of the NGF signaling pathway with how HSV reactivation fits into this pathway. I sympathize with the listener. It's definitely hard to keep track of all the different inhibitors and whether they induce or block reactivation. Inhibiting PI3 kinase activity results in activation of junk and HSV reactivation, which we think is because AKT suppresses DLK activity. Inhibiting junk activity then blocks reactivation. I usually animate this slide with arrows. Instead, I've tried to simplify what the inhibitors are doing in the boxes. I hope that makes it easier to follow. Yeah. And uh, so, um, Fernando had asked about, could we use plus or minus? And the sort of standard symbols that you see in these kinds of diagrams <laughs> are an arrow for activation right. and then two intersecting lines, or right. not intersecting, yeah, not intersecting. T-bar. A T-bar, <laughs> exactly. Um, that I indicates inhibition. So, that's what uh, that'll mean when you see this image. And I'm not sure, Vincent, whether you'll put it in today's show notes or the show notes that it's relevant for, <laughs> 369 or yeah, both I think or whatever. I think but. it should be in uh, the, the one that it's relevant to because people yes. read them, listen yeah. later, you know. So. Right. so you'll have to go back to that one, Fernando, to find it uh, as long as Vincent remembers to put it up. You know, you know um, in general, if we... Have some. This is not for every paper, obviously, but this is a particular one that needed it. Maybe the authors already have these things. We could just contact them and say, "Hey, do you have right. something simple yeah, we could put in the yeah. show notes that you know is yeah. not a figure in the paper, but yeah. we can use?" Yeah. I, I saw a presentation about two years ago, which I just I sort of slid under my chair. It it the final slide looked as though you were touring a gourmet uh, delicatessen with all the sausages of various colors hanging up over the line, which uh, equaled the pathway. It, it, it made no sense whatsoever. There was no way to keep track of anything. And, you know, when you get involved in all of this, uh, you're speaking it as though it's second nature to you. And I've, you've heard talks like that, too. And that's I think they're just speaking to one other person. Unless it's just to themselves, so I appreciate very much the the need for clarification and simplification without dumbing down the content. Um, I, I want to point out that this link, this web uh, web page on turtles all the way down, is really good. It explains the yes. origin of mm -hmm. or of that one possible origin. Yeah, that apparently there have been many. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Good. Thank you for that. All right. A couple of things from Twitter I thought would be worth mentioning, Matthew. Uh, said Twiv Twiv three seventy gives a great, albeit incidental, explanation for passive voice in scientific writing, and that was our discussion last time of how, when you, if you don't want to make viruses do things, as is, is my predilection, then you have to use a passive voice, and it gets harder. But I, I I thought about this a lot during the week, because, you know, my my issue with this, just to mention it again, is that you shouldn't give viruses human characteristics because it's not appropriate. It's a virus. It's not a human. And you don't know if whatever characteristic you are imprinting on the virus is, is actually correct or not. So that's why I like to stay away from that. So that's a good summary of that. Also, AOLSE on Twitter, who actually is Anthony, who gave us uh, the link earlier to the Independent Living article. He wrote something which I thought was lovely. Access is not just a convenience or courtesy. It is essential. Without access, it's not science. It's authority. I just think that's beautiful. That's way of putting it up really mm -hmm. well. And just today, Matt Freeman, our friend who's been on TWIV many times, I sent Mark Lipsitz <laughs> a link to the TWIV with Ralph Barrick and Vinit Menacheri after his comments on not understanding how it was approved during his NSABB presentation. So yesterday, the NSABB had a, um, a meeting, and it was live-streamed. And during it, you know, they let Mark Lipsitch talk. I don't know why. Oh, come on. <laughs> you know, he's not a virologist. And he is, he I, is in public health. He's in public health, but he's never picked up a virus in his life. 
But anyway, he's talking and com- convincing the government that this is bad stuff. He doesn't understand how that work was approved. And anyway, Mar- Matt continues, after several back and forth tweets, his response is great. We'll listen despite not enjoying the ad hominem style. He gives a link to the tweet. Okay, ad hominem it means directed against a person rather than the position they are maintaining. I did it once, a long time ago. I have not done it since. I strenuously object to his position, not to him. Right. right? And I'm very strong about it. Maybe he doesn't like me speaking strongly. Okay, I'm not a calm guy. I'm a first-generation Italian. <laughs> and I cannot stand virology being blocked by people who don't really understand the field. He said um, more recently, oh, last week when we talked about that first uh, cost-benefit Right. Uh, re- uh, not cost. Um, risk benefit. Risk benefit analysis. He said, you know, these are dubious, dubiously valuable experiments. This is just not true. And the problem is he's got a pulpit now and, and the public is listening to him. And he's wrong. Okay, that's what I right. object to. He is wrong. He doesn't understand that these are great experiments. The H5N1 were great experiments. These barrack venet experiments are great. So stop saying this because the public goes, oh, this, this is guy's a Harvard professor. He said it shouldn't have been done. He must be right. And I can't take this. I cannot take it, okay? So I'm not doing ad hominem, and Mark is not going to listen anyway, but I really object to your position. And we, I keep telling him this. I told him it from the beginning. He ignores it. He keeps on with this. I don't know why this was done crap. Well, as I as I commented last time, I, I think the problem is that he's painted himself into a corner. Um, you know, he was very, very vocal against the Fouché and Kawaoka H1N1 papers before anybody had even been able to read them. And now it's become abundantly clear that that was actually really good science that needed to be done. And we learned a lot from it. And now the risk the uh, risk benefit analysis yeah. comes out and essentially says the same thing yep he would need to go back and say yeah you know i called that one wrong but oh something he was novel. so vo- <laughs> he was so vocal at the time yeah. that i don't think he can I, it's I think, unfortunate it's i unfortunate. think he's in an unfortunate position and and i do think that his position is is wrong um is very poorly thought out but that doesn't mean that i think he's a bad person no, and he's he's welcome to his opinion, but sure. it's wrong. But it's wrong, yes. And I do wish at these NSABB meetings they have people who defend the science. Oh, they do. Yeah, but not as passionately as could be done. Well, they ought to have you there. Well, they didn't ask me. <laughs> uh, okay, I'm just very passionate about this. Dixon will tell you that I'm normally a very calm person. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> if While he's in his straitjacket, the moment they release him from that, <laughs> he's a... Tasmanian devil, which leads us into the next topic. Yeah. You know, two <laughs> listeners, Robin and Mark, both sent in, um, in one way or another, this paper, which was recently published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. It's called A Second Transmissible Cancer in Tasmanian Devils. And the, author, the first author is Ruth Pye, and the last author is Greg Woods. And it is from Australia, as you might imagine, Indeed. Tasmania and also the uh, University of Cambridge at the UK and other places throughout. There are people so, out so there, by the way. So I guess now, now Tasmanian devils have gotten a pie in the face. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. Sorry, Ruth. Ruth I pie. make fun of people's last names. but Ruth I, Pye. Just to straighten things out, people sometimes think of Tasmania as separate from Australia. <laughs> it's not. It's part of Australia. Thank you. Yeah, it's good. Now, I just have to tell a little story here at the outset. When my first son, Aiden, was very young, before he could speak properly, he used to watch this TV show, and one of the characters was a Tasmanian devil. Of course. Yep. Looney Tunes. Was that Looney Tunes? Oh, you bet. Yes, absolutely. Okay. The Tasmanian devil and Bugs Bunny. And, yeah. <laughs> so I remember, clearly, he couldn't say Tasmanian devil. Whenever it would come on the screen, he would go, Manny Devil. <laughs> <laughs> and so the first thing I think of when I see these papers on these transmissible cancers. So transmissible cancers. These are tumors... That go. Which is a pretty scary sounding phrase, but it's not. Uh, don't worry. And there, are, there are not many so far, so this is unusual that we have another one now. Um, and we have talked about, actually them all in TWIV, but more in more detail, we have talked about the clam, the soft shell clam neoplasia, neoplasia, which is work done by Steve Goff uh, and Michael, his postdoc, which I wrote about on my blog, and we also had both of them on TWIV which was episode 337, 
appropriately named steamer. This is right. a cancer that, you know, they've isolated from clams from the north to the south of the eastern seaboard of the U.S., and the tumors are clearly all derived from the same progenitor. So somehow it got from one clam to another in the oceans and so forth. So it's a transmissible tumor. And then there are two others. There's the uh, the dog, uh, ven- the canine transmissible venereal tumor transmitted among dogs uh, when they have sex or when they lick or bite each other and so forth, but it is a venereal tumor as well. And again, it is it's not identical to the host. It's different. It comes from a different host. In the case of the dog, it actually originated many, many, many years ago. And then there's the um, Maine devil uh, transmissible <laughs> tumor, tumor, which... Tuner? <laughs> tumor, tumor, which uh, is endemic to uh, the state of Tasmania, which is where the Tasmanian devils are found. Right, Dixon? Right. So, uh, Alan, if the uh, the comic book character caught this, could it be a car tumor? Oh. Mm. oh. And by the way, I object to the use of the word venereal. Why? Because it's a it's a uh, pejorative term. Why it's judgmental. It no, it's a Look very it old term. Yeah, I know that. It's sexually transmitted. Is it's, it's, it's same root as vener- same root as venerable. Yeah, I know. That's right. that's <laughs> almost non-existent also. But this one is actually, um, it's got some emotion-laden term to it. So I, I, I've heard it objected to by a lot of people, and that's why they changed venereal diseases to sexually transmitted diseases. Oh, okay. Well, I don't think the dogs care. No, but I think... Well, also, sexually transmitted disease is more specific Yeah, but and clear. If it's caught by licking, I would rule that out as a sexual activity. So uh, well, well, if you well, okay, let's just move on. Uh, forget it, Dixon. <laughs> Dixon, aren't you glad I came back? <laughs> I'm going to be nice to you. Um, so basically, in in these tumors, at some point in the past, a tumor cell right. uh, originated in an animal, and then it it got transmitted to another animal, where it formed a tumor, and that animal transmitted to another, sure. and that that's what happened. So the actual cell is transmissible, which is really interesting. It's not caused by a virus. And right over on. Uh, on the social media, people have said, is this a virus? No, no, it's not a virus. It is the actual cell yeah, yeah. that is being transmitted. So it's quite rare. And that's and, why this paper... One of the reasons it's rare is because if you take a cell from an individual and move it to another individual, mm-hmm. the immune system and the recipient immediately attacks and destroys it. Exactly. Right. Which is why you can't exactly. just transport transplant organs willy-nilly or bone marrow or what have you. Yeah, yeah. So these transmissible tumors have all acquired some mechanism or other that has allowed them to... Um, Mm-hmm. Uh, to evade that. Yeah, so the one of the ideas is, well, in the clam, for example, one, an important defense against tumors is the MHC molecule on the surface of the cell, which will allow the T cell to target the tumor as foreign and, and kill it. But the apparently the, many of these, well, the clam tumors don't even have MHC on their surface. It's not even known how that would got, be gotten rid of anyway. And um, I believe these Tasmanian devil tumors have very low MHC, which may be uh, one of the mechanisms by which they occur. So these are facial tumors, uh, first discovered in 1996 for the Tasmanian uh, variety. That was the first one. And you get tumors on the face, and then they metastasize commonly to other places, lymph nodes, and they they kill the animal. And this is actually um, causing a uh, population decline in the devil population. Right. I have a question about the devils themselves. How... Homozygous are they as a species? Oh, that, so they do mention that in this book. Yes. They have limited genetic diversity. Exactly. So that might because be. uh, partly. Well, first of all, I should They're point out that species, uh, I don't know right. if you're getting these, Vincent, but Rich is texting that he's on Skype now. Uh-huh. Not too bad. <laughs> <laughs> and he just texted, "You call me, or or I call you." Call you. <laughs> so I think you call. Right. Me. I'm calling him right now. Hey, let's see how rich? this how this ah. new router works. Yeah, I'm not. Uh, at, I don't want to talk about it. How's it it sound? Sounds good so far. Okay. We'll see if you deteriorate. (laughs) Uh, Right. So there are, there are other issues that I don't want to talk about right now. We're talking about Tasmanian devils. We're talking about the devil. Yes. And, uh, Dixon, they're only found in this part of Australia, right? Right. Correct. Okay. And they have some nice photographs of the tumors on the faces, the both, both the original one and the new one that was discovered uh, in this paper. Right. And now, grossly, the, so they found some new tumors. They, they're they always finding tumors in these devils, and they characterize them. 
Uh, and um, the, there were a couple that they found in 2014. They had features that were different from the other tumors. Mm. Right. Um, now, the, the gross anatomy, and this is actually fairly gross anatomy, um, is uh, the figure one in this paper. And I don't recall whether this one was open access. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, but uh, if you if you look at that, they've got the pictures, and and at that level, the it the tumors same. all yeah, look pretty much pretty, the same. But, if you, but then, if you then make, they microanalyze. Yeah, them. if you if you do sections of the tumors and start looking under the microscope, you see that they morphologically they're different. Yeah. Uh, the way the cells are arranged, so they thought, well, this looks different. Um, one of them was these tumors were both negative for a protein called periaxin, which was a marker diagnostic for the facial tumor. So this is different. So they said, let's look at this some more. So they did karyotypes where they look at all the chromosomes uh, of the cells in this tumor, and these were clearly different. How about that? Right? What are the odds, right? <laughs> no, really, those are two yeah. completely different tumors arising in the same population. In the that's, same species. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. yeah. So um, there were some... So DF... The first Tasmanian devil tumor. So they call this now DFT1, devil facial tumor one, one. has uh, two X chromosomes. Hmm. And they find a Y chromosome in this new tumor, which they call DFT2. So the original one probably arose in a female devil, and maybe this one um, arose in a male devil. So that's a, a just looking at this, the chromosomes, which you can do quite nicely. They're beautiful. Chromosomes are just beautiful. Yep. You can see that they're different. Yep. And then they started doing some sequencing. They can look at microsatellites, which they did also for the um, the steamer analysis. Right. Microsatellites are these repetitive DNA tracts. Um, you have a certain motif. It can be two to five base pairs. It's repeated anywhere from five to 50 times. They They occur throughout the genome, and they can be used sort of as, as markers. And uh, so they did microsatellite analysis and they showed that um, these new tumors are different from the original one. How new are they? What do you mean how new? In what sense? When did they arise? Well, that's a big question. Well, we don't know. Well, they've been looking though, haven't they? How would you look, Dixon? The same way they looked for the first tumor, Vincent. Dixon, they find tumors in animals. How would they know? No, but there's they're only they're so many... Tasmanian devils, though it's an island. Yeah, they've been looking at this for years. I want, to, I want no, you to they, tell me how you would do it. They would do uh, random trappings of animals right. throughout the entire island and then survey for that. I've, I presume they've been doing this for some time now. Right. So these were new. Well, at least so, since 19, so I want to know how new. 96, right, is the first time the first tumor was discovered. Okay. They had four, I think, four animals here with this new tumor. Now they have to go back and look to see right. how, you know. How maybe many have it? Have hey, maybe it's only four, and it originated. Yeah. But I don't think it originated in these animals because they're different from the host. Okay, you know, so the cell, the genome of these tumor cells are different from the host. So they can't. They originated in some other animal, but how long ago? That's you know, we wild. don't know. It's interesting. Right. Um, they look. Um, as far as I know, there are no other carnivores on Tasmania. Mm -hmm. No other naturally. Occurring. Yeah, I mean, there are some wild dogs and cats, but I think that's mostly marsupials. Uh, they're all marsupials, but uh, they're all herbivores. If you sequence the genome of these tumors, then you can see what we call polymorphisms, and they they show that the two tumors are distinct. They don't w share. Were thylacines on Tasmania before? I don't, I don't, I don't <laughs> think so. Are so, you, are, you uh, there? are you there, Rich Condit? Uh, yes, I'm here. Can you hear me now? Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. Maybe they okay, were. So, Alan, maybe they were. Uh, in the Sorry, microsatellite, were, right. uh, yeah, in the microsatellite right. analysis, what I liked was that not only are DFT1 and DFT2 distinct from each other, but if you take two different DFT1 tumors, they're the same as each other. Yeah. Two different DFT2 yeah. tumors, they're the same as each other, and the DFT2 tumors are different than. The hosts. Yes, exactly. Okay. It's amazing. And two different hosts are different from each other. So it's clear that the tumors are somewhere way back in time clonal. DFT2. Right. Yep. Uh, and the DFT2 yeah. tumors are different from the hosts they're growing in and different from the other tumors. Right. And it's likely that this is the only version of that, that is no other animal group has this because of their behavior. This particular tumor? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, they bite right. each other. The, the Tasmanian basis. devils bite each other a lot. That's right. That's as just part of their normal social lives. Yeah, yeah. And that's how yeah. this thing spreads. And this is distinct from the dog and the steamer tumor, of course. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, the, uh, they say something which I like very much. D these tumors are allogeneic grafts. 
mm-hmm. within yes. their hosts. That's basically what mm-hmm. they are, right? Mm-hmm. They have come from another animal, and they have they're growing in these devils. Um, they look at MHC molecules also because um, they've previously shown that MHC molecules, which I told you are important for destruction by T cells, aren't expressed. Actually, they're not produced on the cell surface. They use the word expressed, but I'm changing it <laughs> to, to produce on the cell surface of most of uh, the tumor cells, the type the DFT1 cells. And so they look at uh, the genes, the MHC genes, class 1 genes from two DFT2 tumors and their hosts, and they, they show that DFT2 has a different class 1 MHC genotype from DFT1 and from the host as well as for the microsatellite. So this is a distinct tumor, and it's distinct from the host. So that's basically the data here. Five. This tumor has been found in five male devils so far, mm. 2014 and 2015. So Dixon, you could go there and and trap and look for this. Uh, well, they're doing that now. I'm sure you don't want they to are. go. You don't want to go, Dixon. Oh, I've been there already. Well, I'm saying you could go back. Um, if I did, I would bring my fly rod. Mm-hmm. And my so snake repellent. Second, and my snake repellent. <laughs> so the second uh, transmissible tumor in Tasmanian devils, they yep. say it ch- could challenge our understanding that the emergence of transmissibility in cancer is very rare. Maybe not. Maybe it's not as rare as we think. Yeah. So superficially, also- superficially looking at these animals, the tumors didn't were not really distinguishable. Is right. that correct? Right. Super right. gross. So you, right. you you don't know that uh, that they're different until you do. Either histology or karyotyping or both. Bingo. Right. Exactly. Okay. So do we So just looking at tumors in devils, you don't know what's going on. Uh in or you know, there's there could be more out there. Could be. Sure. Do we know what cell type this was originally derived from? I haven't seen that no, indicated so. anywhere. So let's see. The I know the um the steamer tumor is called a uh uh, it's got a it's got a name which is escaping me at the moment, and you know they could look at the cell type and say what the origin was. No, but well, they, I don't see it. In I think the cancer cells are so undifferentiated. You might not be able to do that. Well, you, yeah, the origin you might not, but you can classify them into certain kinds of yeah cancer cells, right? It would be interesting start, to see if they pick this up by carnivorism. You know by because when an animal eats ate. another animal, especially devils, you mean they, originally? Con- they consume the whole carcass. I mean, right. they don't it's just a, eat the meat. They eat everything. It's I guess you might say it. something they ate really agreed with them. <laughs> exactly. But they, they clearly got it from another devil, right? Well, what's the first incident? Most well, because the genome, the genome looks like a devil. Right. Okay. Although if you, yeah. look up, yeah. if you look at the dog tumor, um, I found a site for that. It's quite interesting. They... They can't tell if it originated in a wolf or a dog. I guess because ah. they're so close. Well, right? they are very close. Right. right. Now, one other... Um, so they they present two possibilities for why we found now two of these, what we thought were freakishly rare, mm-hmm. transmissible cancers in Tasmanian devils. One is that maybe this is a much more common event than we previously thought. Maybe trans- transmissible tumors happen all the time, and we're just noticing it because this is a closely monitored population. Um the other possibility, which I actually kind of favor just intuitively, is Tasmanian devils are not very genetically diverse. Mm-hmm. Right? Um, like pretty much every other indigenous species in Australia, they are, they are on the brink of extinction. Um, that is, the ones that aren't already extinct. So there's a small population. It's a not a very genetically diverse population. Um, they have some in zoos and in captive breeding programs that they're they're using to try and keep them from getting totally wiped out but there are very few of these running around in the wild and most of them are very closely related which may predispose them to this sort of thing because they have less diversity in their uh in their mhc repertoire Mm -hmm. right now i am told by steve goff that there is more to come Uh Uh Mm -hmm. so we look forward so maybe on the devils or on steamer or on well, he doesn't work on devils, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> on steamer. <laughs> right. So uh, it's probably more widespread than we thought. Maybe we'll move into the chowder. Chowder? <laughs> From you the steamers. Clams? Yeah, yeah, sure. What what kind of clams? Those are quahogs and that sort of thing, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there are lots of uh, 
What do you call them? Bivalves? Dev- uh, In- no. Yep. Dixon. Bivalves. 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 Yeah. No, you don't call Dixon a bivalve. No, I'm not. Hey, Dixon, People would you say you're bivalve? not being nice to him. <laughs> nice. I just looked up a paper called uh, The Pathology of Devil Facial Tumor Disease in Tasmanian uh, Devils. Uh, First author is Low. This is from 2006. So, a pathology report. Uh, bottom line, the results indicate DFTD to be an undifferentiated soft tissue neoplasm. Mm. Okay. Right. There you go, Dixon. Soft Round tissue. to spindle shape cells, that off leaves it with wide open. pseudo capsule <laughs> and divided into lobules by delicate fibrous septi. Yeah, that's still doesn't tell where it's from, but that's right. Well, that's yeah. as best they could it's do. And these are yeah, professional yeah, pathologists. Sure, 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 so, sure, sure, sure. There you yeah, go. Yeah. No, got it. That's probably that probably says it's so far drifted from what it was. <laughs> no, we'll sure. never know. Sure. Yeah. I mean, if you look at the karyotype of this DFT1, it's got these four marker chromosomes, M1, 2, 3, and 4, that, from what I can tell, are like totally unrelated yeah. to right. what the normal karyotype is. I mean, they're really weird. Yeah. The DFT2 karyotype is a, a little more closely related to the parent, mm-hmm. it seems. Okay. That is our snippet. And now we have a paper. Neva sent us this paper. She suggested it as a snippet, but I like its polio. (laughs) This is an important topic. And we got some other stuff to talk about with polio, so I thought we'd make it a paper. And all disclosure, this is a PLOS pathogens paper. It's called New Strains Intended for the Production of an Activated Polio Vaccine at Low Containment After Eradication by Nolson, Burleson, Giles, Fox, McCadam, and Minor. And I know... These, I know Phil Mino for dozens of years, and I know Andrew McCadam. And I also was the editor who handled the reviews of this paper. So, full disclosure. Right. But I really think it's an interesting story. And here's the issue. 18 years ago, Alan Dove and I told the world <laughs> that we have to switch from OPV to IPV in a science editorial. That's oral polio vaccine to in, uh, inactivated polio vaccine. And WHO, this was 1990. Nine, right, Alan? Yeah. Right. And the reason for that is because, as we've talked about many times before on TWIV, OPV always reverts to, um, to a paralytic form. You give it to somebody and they're pooping out paralytic virus. And you could get, um, at that time, you could theoretically get an outbreak of vaccine-derived polio if you had an incompletely vaccinated population. Yeah. Um, and yes, and the WHO's response was, no, ah, no, not a problem. Not a problem. <laughs> we got it. We got it covered. We, we got this. Covered. So ah. they actually had a response in the same issue of science as, yes. as we did, right? Yes. Just I- to be just to be more complete, the OPV oral polio vaccine is a an active. I don't want to say live. You could say infectious. But you replic- could say infectious. infectious right. I can say infectious. Very you- infectious, <laughs> atten- attenuated virus, whereas the uh, IPV inactivated polio vaccine is wild type virus that has been grown up and inactivated. So, and that's injected, mm-hmm. uh, and it does not replicate in you. You just make antibodies to the capsid proteins, and that's where your immunity comes from. Whereas the oral virus is obviously ingested, and it replicates in you. And as Alan has already said, the problem with that is that you wind up shedding neurovirulent virus. Right. right. So as as predicted and i guess it was around 2002 2002 exactly um there was an outbreak of polio virus on hispaniola which is haiti in the dominican republic um and that was wacky because the virus had been supposedly eradicated from there and then the who investigated and they found that the virus that was breaking out on hispaniola was vaccine derived exactly and since and then there have been sucks. many other documented circulating yes. vaccine-derived polio virus outbreaks, and eventually WHO realized that Dove and Racaniello were right, <laughs> although they didn't put it that way, right, Alan? No, no. <laughs> they realized that vaccine-derived polio was going to be a problem for them. Yeah. Um, and uh, They've slowly developed an alternative, which is to transition to an activated polio vaccine. That's a darn good idea. They go to the bivalent oral vaccine and start using... The inactivated, uh, type inactivated, inactivated for type 2. Right. Because okay. they're still circulating vaccine-derived type 2s around, and right. you want to immunize until those go away. But um, type 3 has not been seen since November 2012, so it's likely that'll be declared eradicated next. And then there'll be another transition to type, type 3 IPV. IPV. 
And then right. type one, f for which there were 70 cases of wild type infections last year, and um, is likely to go soon as well. So, you know, we're going to eventually, it, the plan will be to go to IPV all around. It's turtles so, all around. It's IPV and, all around. And so how so, long will the wild type last before you don't have to worry about that in the environment? That uh, that's a good question. I don't know. I mean, if it's, um, I don't people, know. People who are immunosuppressed can keep secreting it for decades. So, um, well, so they, my, my, they typically excrete, they typ I'm sorry, one, they typically excrete vaccine-derived viruses, Alan. Yes. I think the wild ones are, are less persistent. Uh, how long exactly, though? Uh, well, right, uh, but I think Dixon's question was getting at when will the virus be gone, gone. Right. When do you have to stop vaccinating? When, when can, right. well, you not have to, but when could you theoretically Whenever stop we don't detect it any longer in the environment. Maybe when we don't detect vaccine-derived or wild-type in the environment or in people any longer than in principle, yes. I, I think this would be a horrible idea to <laughs> stop vaccinating. But in principle, you could stop. And that was actually the sales pitch for the eradication campaign back in the late 90s when they were saying they were going to wipe out polio by 2000 and then... Um, these poor countries would not have to spend money on polio vaccine, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is is just a really bad approach to public health. Um, I think it's totally wrongheaded. Does um, anybody know what the situation is in North Korea? No. So <laughs> I would say that's a caveat for all of this. Then It's an interesting uh, question because on the charts, so polioeradication.org has polio case breakdown by country more or less every week. And, you know, they don't show up <laughs> ever on that. So we don't get any information from them. I think they so, they didn't have much or any back at the last point when there were any data. And so the presumption is that it's not there, but there's not any guarantee of that because you can't really get reliable information on anything from there. Yeah. That's why I asked. I mean, so basically this synchronization from OPV to IPV is just mm -hmm. type 2. But nevertheless, it's really amazing that this is happening. Oh, yeah. And it's going to happen for the other serotypes as well. Right. They're still going to maintain monovalent type 2 oral polio vaccine for a response to type 2 poliovirus outbreak. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, this all raises a problem. Actually, a few. But one of them, <laughs> one of them is uh, what the subject of this paper is. Um, and that is... How do you keep making vaccine when the virus is eradicated from the wild? Because the, and this is very different from the situation with smallpox, where the vaccine is a, to, a totally different virus from the one you're trying to eradicate. So there was not a problem with making smallpox vaccine as wild variola disappeared. Okay, we're going to be growing vaccinia, but vaccinia isn't going to give anybody smallpox. Polio vaccines are are poliovirus. And so if you are manufacturing OPV or IPV, then the manufacturing facility becomes your biggest risk for an outbreak. Yep. In and particular, I inactivated polio. Especially in IPV. That case, yes. In that case, you're growing wild type virus. You're growing wild type virus yes. in huge quantities. And in fact, there have been incidents where um, uh, vaccine plants had, you know, a spill that actually a accidentally went into a drain and then the river is full of polio. And these generally happen in industrialized countries where everybody's vaccinated. So it's, oh, gee, wasn't that interesting. But that's going to become a whole lot less humorous when we're getting to a point where, you know, you've got a sparsely vaccinated population, maybe vaccine being manufactured near a sparsely vaccinated population. Um, and then this could turn into a major disaster. So the question is, what are we going to do? And the WHO has kind of been hand-waving on this. I think the latest theory is that they... Well, the latest, the latest advocacy, and I think this is described in this report, um, is that they recommend moving IPV production to the attenuated strains that were previously used in OPV. Yeah, the Sabin strains, right? The yeah. Sabin strains. So you would use, instead of growing up wild-type virus and inactivating it, you would grow up the Sabin strains, which are inherently pretty safe to begin with, um, even in an unvaccinated world. And then you would inactivate those and use that for the basis. So kind of a belt and suspenders protective mm -hmm. system. And people uh, in the past have have tried to make Sabin IPV. I used to work with a company who did this. Um, it, it, it works. The, the yield is a little lower than the wild-type strains. Um, right. But there's still the possibility that 
if someone were infected with a Sabin strain, it would revert in the gut, and they could right. leave the facility and spread it and so forth. So that's where this paper comes in. So, these, Rich, oh, Rich, it, so go ahead. Rich wants to talk sorry. for a long time now. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I, I just want, I just want some further clarification because I'm, I'm still a little confused on sort of the, uh, the. Uh, short-term and longer-term future of the vaccination protocols. So is uh, Alan's criticism notwithstanding, is the assumed or stated goal ultimately to withdraw vaccination entirely? Yes. I mean, you'd have a stockpile yes. okay, that you could do for an yeah. outbreak, but and the idea have, is to withdraw it entirely. Yeah. You'd have a stockpile okay. of vaccine and you'd have antivirals, which are currently in development. Right. Just okay, so, right, so more, more, we're, go ahead. Uh, so more current than that, my understanding from reading the document that that uh, uh, Vincent circulated from the WHO was that when they go to the bivalent oral vaccine, uh, it, it, I got the sense that they are not now planning on vaccinating everybody with the inactivated type 2, but rather having a stockpile right. of inactivated type 2 that they could use in the event of an outbreak. Have I got that correct? That's the way I understand it also. Okay. Okay. So the idea is, uh, and this would be stepwise, and we're looking at the first step somewhere in April, we're going to go from the trivalent to the bivalent oral vaccine lacking type 2 and we're going to have enough see because I've always understood this as one of the one of the issues is being able to grow and distribute enough inactivated polio vaccine okay uh, and so it seems to me that there would be a problem in replacing the oral vaccine with the inactivated vaccine but if in fact the strategy is to go to the bivalent oral vaccine and not try to vaccinate everybody with the inactivated vaccine, but have a stockpile of it. And I, there was some implication as well that you might, uh, there are places globally that are more at risk than others where you might use it uh, differently. So, but at any rate, not to vaccinate everybody, but to have this stockpile of the inactivated stuff in case there's an outbreak. Right. And then as we've already described, uh, theoretically, when type 3 is declared eradicated, you would go to a monovalent vaccine using the same strategy with a backup IPV for type 3, et cetera. Okay. Right, so so that's I, misspoke. Cool. I misspoke. The synchronized right. switch is not from OPV to IPV. It's from trivalent to bivalent. And then right. they keep type 2 IPV around if there's an outbreak. That's correct. Right. right. Okay. Right. Now, as a, as a practical matter, um, this is not uh, – this, this ends up with a two-tiered system. Um, in the developed world, it is still standard to receive the trivalent IPV, which has now been combined into one of the standard um, childhood vaccines. I forget mm -hmm. which one it is, but it was um, it was part of the series my daughter got uh, that, uh, you know, oh, yeah, there's IPV as part of, and it wasn't yeah. MMR. I think it it's diphtheria, tetanus, pertussis. Is it DPT now? Yeah. DPT, yeah. IPV? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, so... Kids in the U.S. and Europe and and uh, you know developed countries around the world are going to still get um, vaccinated with IPV as they have been for years. It's just kids in the poor countries who are now not going to get vaccinated for type two unless there's an outbreak in an area. Right. And I would presume that somewhere down the road, maybe decades, actually. Uh, if if this works out with the rest of the world where they're not getting any vaccine anymore and there doesn't seem to be a problem, that that vaccination would be discontinued in the U.S. as well. I, I, I presume. I don't know that. I assume that's the goal. Um, uh, again, I don't think that's wise, but mm -hmm. uh, that appears to be the general direction the WHO wants to recommend. It's interesting because in the case of, in the case of smallpox, when that was declared eradicated, the issue became there's a certain, because the vaccinia is a live virus right. or an active virus, a replicating virus, an infection. <laughs> so it's, now you got it. Infection works. 
Because I have trouble with this live. He's, the risk he's of getting sick from the vaccine was greater than the risk of getting sick from the disease. Yeah. Right. But with inactivated polio virus, except for the manufacturing issues that we'll uh, uh, discuss as we go on, there's really no risk, right? The right. only problem is that there's a cost and you get a shot. And the marginal cost of that, uh, certainly in the, in the developed countries in the context of a combination vaccine, it really doesn't figure into the price of that of delivering that vaccine. Mm-hmm. Um, the The cost of the shot is mostly about the labor in the pediatrician's office in the developed mm-hmm. world. And, uh, and if it's combined with another vaccine, and if it's combined with neg- another vaccine that you're always going to need anyway, you might as well just keep giving it because then you don't have to worry about this thing ever coming back. And in fact, what we saw with smallpox, one of the big problems was that after the eradication and the cessation of vaccination, that removed all motivation for doing any kind of research on an improved smallpox vaccine. And suddenly a disease that had been eradicated then became uh, the most promising biological weapon ever. Hmm. Because, yeah, and that became the emphasis of Soviet research and and uh, U.S. research for that reason. And it is now now we're back full circle at the point where, um, uh, you know, the biodefense industry wants to develop better smallpox vaccines, having let the whole thing languish for decades. Okay, so that brings us to our paper, uh, which is, uh, as I said, trying to see if we could have another stock of uh, viruses to use for IP- IPV production instead of wild type, instead of the Sabin strains. Right. And this is based on the, the fact that one of the major determinants of attenuation in the polio, the Sabin poliovirus vaccines resides in the five prime untranslated region of the viral RNA, a highly structured region. And it's been shown that all three vaccine types have, Sabin types have mutations in this five prime UTR. Uh, and they revert upon replication of the viruses in the intestinal tract. And they've focused on the type 3 5' prime non-coding region here in this paper because that's the best studied. And there we know at 472, nucleotide 472, the type 3 wild type strain, which is virulent, has a C at that position. And in the vaccine, it is a U. And that U is incredibly important for reducing the pathogenicity of these viruses. In fact, if you change the U to a C, it will now cause paralysis in an animal model. And it's that U that reverts to a C within one to two days during replication in the intestine. And for years, Miner and his colleagues have often said, could we introduce other changes into this region, which is highly RNA structured, to make the virus attenuated and prevent it from reverting? or make it less likely that it would revert. Because right now you just need one base change, and boom, it's reverted. So they've introduced, in the vicinity of 472, a number of changes that would make it very difficult for it to revert. I don't think it would ever prevent it. Eventually the virus could probably get around it. But they've, in this paper, made one, two, three, four different derivatives with increasing base changes in this region, such that you'd need at least two uh, to revert uh, and get neurovirulence. And well, they, and they did it. They did it pairwise. So you would actually need. Uh, they've got an uh, an A and a U that are opposite each other. Right. That on a would, stem. Yeah. On a stem. Uh, so there's a selective pressure that would favor that energetically favors those remaining exactly. a U and an A. If you change one of them, if you change the A to something else, it's not going to pair with that U that's less energetically favored, which should apply a little bit of selective right. pressure against it, you'd, and you'd need the other one changed anyway. Right. So, for example, the 472U, normally in the vaccine, it's base paired with a G. Right. They've changed it to an A. So now if the U goes to a C, that's no good. The right. A would also have to change. So you need two base changes. Two, two simultaneous base changes. Exactly. And they've done uh, that throughout this region. They've made changes on both sides. And as they... Yeah, I, I think these are going to be really stable genetically. Yes. According to their work, they are. Um, you know, the, they have, the, prob- the probabilities are multiplicative. So if there's a <laughs> one in 10,000 chance that uh, one of these can change and you need two of them, uh, that's a one in 10 to the eighth okay, probability. Right. 
Okay, and if you do that for, if you have to change two or three of these, it goes down to just vanishingly small. Well, remember, these are not going to be used as OPVs. They're going to be simply used in a production facility to grow lots of virus to inactivate. Right. So, so you the go worst thing that could happen, virus. you know, in the worst scenario, they could infect the worker in the facility, but they're probably not going to revert in the intestine of that worker. And if they if they revert, I mean, they're coming. You're coming at this from the Sabin strains. Yeah. So we're talking worst case, you revert to one of the Sabin strains before on the way to getting to. Yeah. It's a long, long way to virulence for these viruses if they're not virulent, which is obviously a question they're addressing in this paper. Yeah. So they they look at the replication of these different construct viruses in cell culture, and um, they look at neurovirulence. They look at their antigenicity and so forth. And as they introduce more of these paired changes in the five prime UTR the viruses have more and more of a defect at higher temperatures. This is actually one of the phenotypes of the Sabin strains that at high temperatures, they don't replicate as well. Can you elaborate on that? Why that attenuates it or m makes it favorable for a vaccine? So it's just the observation that these, these changes in the five prime UTR, um, decrease the replication at higher temperatures. And when the vir when the viruses revert in someone's gut, that, goes away and okay. so why that if, if it has anything to do with uh, uh, neurovirulence we don't know it's just been used as a marker for years uh, for the vaccine viruses as they're produced and then for uh, for revertant viruses and so if you introduce more changes in this five prime utr they become progressive the viruses become progressively more disabled at higher temperatures and so that's suggesting that the changes that you're making you know the viruses can still replicate uh, but at higher temperatures, as you disrupt this domain, this is called domain five, by the way, where the 472 change is, they, you get a less and less replication at higher temperatures. They put, oh, these, they put these into neuro, uh, transgenic mice that produce the human receptor for poliovirus. This is a, uh, a line that we made and others have made many years ago, and you can test them. Uh, they're used actually now for testing of the oral polio vaccines. And these, uh, the last two viruses they made with the most changes, they're called S18 and 19. None of them caused any paralysis, whereas the wild type strain, of course, causes paralysis, and they quantify that. And even the Sabin strain can cause a little bit if you give them enough uh, virus. You were going to say something, Dick? Yeah, I was. I mean, <clears throat> why, why tinker with this when you can just lop the whole thing off and put in something that's the same shape because it's not translated, but totally different sequences for every single base pair? Why don't they do well, that? Because you do need this. This has a function. What the is the function? That's what I was being asked then. This uh, area of the genome has a role in transla translation and RNA synthesis. So if you completely replace this with a structure, the virus is not working. No, I mean, the structure has to look exactly the same as the one yeah, you've I understand. got there with it's, different People have, have done that. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. You've got to have some right. conserved sequencing. All right. So they, I, th yes. I have a question, too, because they, they look at these several different cell types um, and is one or more of these cell types more important for growth of this virus to make inactivated vaccine? Yeah, I, I missed the cells. relevance of that. Viro yeah, the cells are the are the standard. Yeah, they okay. use viros for, for right. Vaccine. That's but what the at, industry uses. <clears throat> okay. yeah, yes, for the inactivated but, vaccine. Yeah, but relative to these new vaccines, they're uh, as we'll see a, a a little bit problematic, but they can get around the problem. Okay. So the next experiment they do is very interesting. They now want to say, let's make some seed viruses that we can use here. They passage them in Vero cells 10 times at different temperatures, 33, 35, 37 degrees. They don't get any mutations in this domain 5, so none of the changes they've put in revert or, or become something else. But they get changes in a protein coding gene called 2A, which is a protease that is needed to process uh, the viral proline it's been shown before that this happens when you introduce changes in the five prime UTR, and you try and suppress them. You get changes in two A. We don't know why this works. We don't know why two A complements these mutations. But the cool thing is, the changes in two A um, don't affect neurovirulence in this mouse model. I think it takes away the temperature sensitivity, basically, of of these changes in the five prime non coding region. Uh, so they use these viruses. Uh, as seed stocks then for 
the rest of their experiments. And then what they do is they'll take um, viruses based on, um, so the 2A is outside the capsid region. So they now take their virus with the 2A changes and the 5' prime UTR changes, and they just substitute the capsid coding region for each of the three serotypes of, of poliovirus, types 1 and 2, because the work was already originally done in type 3. So now you can immediately attenuate all three serotypes uh, in, a, in sort of a cassette way and then use those for vaccine production. Is, uh, is 2A the same protease that cleaves the cap binding protein? It is, yeah. So I, I was wondering whether that has, because, you know, compromising this, uh, this iris is going to compromise translation. I was wondering if the changes in the protease, uh, if their suppressing effect doesn't have something to do with um, whether or not you yeah. cleave the cap binding protein as efficiently, you know. It's, abs- it's possible, sure. It could be. No, People have tried to look at this, and they don't get any answer to the question whether these 2A changes are somehow affecting translation. Um, but that's a possibility, yeah. So what I thought was cool about this is, uh, have we already mentioned this one mutation in 18S? Yeah. Because that seems to be the key. That That is the mutation in the protease that shows up most commonly. Yeah. And if you just put that mutation in by itself, it will suppress the problems. The, it will suppress the... Um, uh, uh, replication effects of the uh, mutations uh, in the iris. So my sense is that they created these viruses that had the the iris mutations and included N18S so that that virus would do okay. If you don't do that and you, and you just use the uh, domain 5 mutants to start with, then as you passage the virus, you create these two-A suppressor uh, mutations, and you don't know quite what you're going to get. Exactly. But if you start exactly. out and put that mutation that has the suppressive effect in it, then the virus doesn't have to uh, come up, sorry, that's anthropomorphic, but the virus yeah. doesn't have to come up with any other suppressing mutations. Yeah. And, and so it's more stable. Yeah, you're basically make, stable. You're making a seed stock that you know that the composition of Right, it's not going to change, presumably. Whereas, right, if you if you did this without the two A mutations, they might arise later, and then you don't know what you have, right? right. But I also think that the two A mutations help the the virus grow better in vero cells. Absolutely. Yeah, this whole suppressing effect of the two A, I understand, only really arises in the vero cells. It's only really in the vero cells. You're fading out, Rich. Alvin the chipmunk. Oh, just no. uh, can you unplug your USB? <laughs> try that. You know? Yeah, so the these the reason they put these two A suppressors in, and this is a little confusing for everyone. I'm sorry, is that so the the, the viruses would grow better, and the neurovirulence is not affected. And they actually test that. They then take these S19 viruses that have been passed to acquire two A mutations. They test them. They they put the capsid of the other two strains into them, and they test their neurovirulence in mice, and they're beautiful. They're attenuated. They also show that the virus yield is good. Uh, it's stable on pathogen cell culture, and the antigenicity is good as well. They do some uh, immunogenicity tests by immunizing uh, animals and, and looking at the kind of antibodies that are made, and they all look good in terms of uh, vaccine production. I mean, these these look good from my view. They are stable. They look like good seeds for IPV production, you know. But the the problem is, and I'm sure Alan will agree, you can't just use these. You have to test them. Yes. Mm-hmm. And you have to test them and show that they can prevent polio. And with 70 cases a year now and, and less, we're in the Ebola situation where we can't test the vaccine. So despite this lovely work, I don't think that this will ever see the light of day. Right. And now, did you mention they also looked at um, the primate models? I didn't mention the primates. Okay, yeah, they also, just as an additional check, they looked at infectivity of these. They gave them orally to um, Cynomolgus macaques um, and uh, and looked for replication of the virus in the macaque gut and looked for seroconversion, and they found um, that the virus, that the Sabin strains replicate in the gut and they cause, um, they, they you get antibodies in the monkeys, um, 
against the Saban strains, but their S19 and its derivatives um, do not replicate in the gut. You don't get you don't get virus out that you didn't put in, um, and you don't get any seroconversion, which is consistent with the idea that this gut wise, this is a virus that's just not going anywhere. Yeah. So I I mean this is interesting work, but unfortunately. I don't think anyone can use this because it can't be tested. Uh, well, people, right? And I, I, don't, I just can't see the U.S. approving the FDA approving this without any tests in people. The the test you could do, you could do an immunogenicity test, right? Um, sure, but and, you can't do an efficacy test. No, no, you can't realistically do an efficacy test. But this is the kind of thing that you might be able to um, to implement post eradication. Um, as a as an ongoing stockpile type of thing. Well, you know, we can whip this out and make more vaccine if we need it. Um, I, again, I think the solution here is to just continue vaccinated with the combination vaccines that we're already using in the developed world and ideally get to the point where injected vaccines of all types can be delivered reliably to poor countries. Yeah, uh, which is kind of what the WHO should be focusing on because they're supposed to be improving public health worldwide on all fronts. But that's not where the political. So is. once once let's say once eradication of all. All right. So type two has been declared eradicated. Right. Now, how do you make and we'll get into another issue in a moment, but how do you make type two IPV at the moment? Because they're all made with virulent type two virus. Right. Is the containment any different now because type 2 has been declared eradicated? Will it be in the future? Will it have to be a BSL-4 production facility? If they Well, declaring that it has to be a BSL-4 pr uh, production facility is tantamount to saying that all production must stop. <laughs> so it has to be BSL-4 Seriously, plus. because no, no pharma company that's in the narrow profit margin vaccine business is going to front the money to make a... a vaccine at these scales in a BSL-4 facility. That is just insanely expensive. You'd have to have the entire production line probably recertified. Yeah, that's right. Um, this it, That's not going to happen. Mm. And I think everybody involved knows that's not going to happen. So if they say at some point that, um, that type 2 can only be worked with in BSL-4, um, that's the end of type 2 vaccine production. Unless they have yeah. an exemption for that. Now, the WHO, it's a very important to point out, the WHO does not have regulatory power. Um, it would be up to the FDA to decide whether, or, you know, the European, um, uh, forgot the abbreviation, the European agency um, that regulates drugs there or what have you to decide whether they want to effectively halt production. Yeah. Uh, or whether they want to switch over to using the Sabin strains in production of the polio, poli the inactivated vaccine. But that gets back to the problem you just pointed out, which is you'd have to retest it, and you can't. Yeah. Would you have to retest it? And you, and you also said that they didn't grow very well when people have tried that in the past. The, sa the Sabin IPV, yeah. They, right. They grow or less you well. Would, from a regulatory standpoint, yes. It's a different virus. Yeah. Um, I mean, as virologists, and we look at this and we say, well, it should be, it's immunogenic. It's immunogenic in the gut. It ought to work. It, yeah, it ought to work. But if you don't have the data showing that that particular virus in an inactivated form is immunogenic, then you don't have what you need for an approval. I want to point out that um, this problem with not being able to test in humans uh, is the same problem they, uh, they have had in approving Pox virus drugs. Yes. Yeah. Okay. ST two forty six has uh, it's been stockpiled for what they call compassionate use, I guess, or for emergency use. But it is not approved, and the reason it's not approved is because you can't test it in people. Now, the uh, FDA uh, came up with a uh, uh, the notion that what's has been called the two animal rule where you come right. up with two of the best possible uh, animal models uh, that you can uh, and prove efficacy uh, in those with your drug or your vaccine. And if uh, that works out, then it, uh, the idea was that it would be approved. And after years of, of testing 
every possible model you could think of in both uh, primates and uh, and other animals. And uh, the FDA has not been satisfied with its own two animal rule <laughs> yes. uh, sufficiently mm. to license uh, ST two forty six. And so uh, Alan's point is uh, quite well taken that. Um, if uh, the history so far is that if you can't uh, test this in humans, even if you come up with a couple of really good animal models, getting it approved is going to be a struggle at best. Right. So there's a WHO document called GAP3, the Global Action Plan Number 3 for polio eradication. And there they define vaccine and wild type strains. Okay. Vaccine strains, any strain licensed for use as a vaccine like Sabin, okay? Wild-type strains are everything else. So the strains they have made here are considered wild-type wild strains. Type. <laughs> so, nevertheless, and therefore they, need to be destroyed. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. I think they uh, that, do, that's actually, actually, yeah. Yeah, that's something they mentioned in the paper is that, um, you know, these are, are under the WHO definitions, these are wild-type strains, um, and they give a few takes on why you know, why they may not have to destroy them um and they they point out you know well they, the rules could be changed to allow for this sort of thing yeah, so they say gap three is, a, is an evolving document which yes. basically says maybe we, the, all these things don't mean anything right um but there you can retain wild strains in certain facilities just like you know there are two places that have smallpox viruses so right you know that's fine now relevant to this a few weeks ago i got an email from the cdc asking me to fill out a survey uh, telling them what different kinds of polio viruses I had. And, um, you know, we have all three serotypes, vaccine and wild-type strains. And so basically the WHO has said at the end of last year, because type 2 is eradicated and in April we're going to switch from trivalent to bivalent OPV, uh, we want all wild-type 2 strains destroyed by the end of 2015 – and then in July, a few months after the transition, we want all type 2 vaccine strains destroyed as well. And only a few facilities are going to be able to maintain them, you know, facilities that are critical for you know, vaccine distribution and, and right. testing of isolates and so forth. So I emailed uh, a guy, Olin Q at CDC. I said, well, you know, we have grants to work on polio. He said, well, right now you just have to destroy type 2. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, as of today, I should be destroying all of my type 2 stocks of uh, wild-type polio. And we have quite a quite a few. In fact, we've been working on a project with this, so we got to stop that, which is weird that we have to stop it right now. But then type 3, as I said, hasn't been seen since November of 2012. I would guess that in a few years that's going to be declared eradicated. Then, the, as I said, the type 2 wild-type strains will have to go. They'll probably get rid of type 3, sorry, type 3 strains, uh, the type 3 wild type will have to go. They'll probably have to get rid of, uh, do a transition from bivalent to monovalent, i.e. only type 1 OPV, and then we'll have to destroy our type 3 vaccine strains. And then when type 1 goes, the same thing. So over the next few years, we basically will have to get rid of all of our strains, starting with type 2 right now. So I, right. you know, I've worked on polio since 1979, and I'm a little sad that I have to do this. I understand the need, but it's sad because I spent a lot of time thinking about these viruses and we have to just put them in the autoclave and get rid of them. So I think that's a little weird and unusual. Not doesn't happen very often. I know it happened with smallpox, but uh, now it's happening with polio. So, Did people have to destroy rinderpest stocks? <laughs> Don't know. I, I could ask, assume so. I could ask uh, Paul Dupre. Let me let's let me text them. Can yeah. So that's basically it. So I'm sorry for the confusion earlier. We're not switching to IPV. We're just going from trivalent right. to bivalent. The IPV though is going to be apparently kept in case of an outbreak, right? And that's mm -hmm. why we need to be able to produce it. And hence the paper here uh, as well. I think we forgot to mention that this paper is in PLOS pathogens, so it's open access. No, no, it was mentioned at the beginning. Oh, good. Okay. Yes, and I, I mentioned Vincent's that. First statement. Uh, I mentioned that I edited it, which meant I that's right. sent it out Had for a review. Completely. That's right. And the press they, really likes this. They they uh, picked it up. A lot of press interest, as yeah. you might. Uh, How about the they, WHO? They conclude, <laughs> they conclude with this. This last paragraph is actually, you know, they're patting themselves on the back a little bit, but it's a very <laughs> good point. 
um, that the usual process for making attenuated vaccine strains of viruses has been to just kind of do stuff to the virus until you get a strain that's attenuated. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you analyze that strain and you make sure it's attenuated before you distribute it as a vaccine. Um, this is by building on all the basic research that's been done on polio, because it's been such a huge model system for the coronaviruses for decades, they were able to to do an a priori design of an attenuated, stable virus, and it worked. Yep. They say the properties were correctly predicted, predicted. a priori. <laughs> yes. It's funny. <laughs> we were right. Yeah, you're right. right. All right. Dick, uh, Rich Condit, are you still there? I'm still here. All right. Can good. you hear me? I, we can hear you. Yeah. Yes, we can hear you. Um, I, uh, <laughs> a couple of things. I guess Alan just, just said this. This is a rational design yeah. yes. uh, virus, which is a vaccine virus, which is uh, really an incredible uh, div- I mean, that's the way things are going now. But uh, well, it's, you wouldn't it's, be able to buy it at Whole Foods, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, and uh, I forget what else I was going to say. Go exactly. Ahead. It's funny. It's really funny. You should say that. My son was eating Whole Food potato chips this morning. Or at CVS, you can't go in for a shot. He pointed out the non-GMO label on it. He said, "Dad, does this bother you?" He wants to pull my chain. You know. <laughs> And did it? <laughs> uh, he's done it enough. So uh, actually, yeah, that, I, uh, it it sort of does that. They have to put a label on it. Yeah. I mean, I understand that people can. No, have they a don't choice. have to. They really don't have to. They don't have to. But they want to gimmick. because it's a sales thing, right? Right. It it's it's entirely about marketing. Yeah. It's gluten free. I mean, also, I, I bet. I think it's fine if you have a choice, but to use it as a marketing thing, I think yeah. is crap, bogus. Right. Oh, I don't That's want true. to be ad hominem for. Uh, it's non allergenic too. I bet. Uh, this episode of uh, TWIV is also brought to you by ASM Biodefense and Emergent Diseases Research Meeting. This is coming up in February, the 8th through the 10th in Arlington, Virginia. The deadline for the early bird registration rates, January 14th is the last time we will mention this one. Uh, because uh, if you if you get in then, it'll be cheaper for you. This is the premier event to discuss how to defend against bioterrorism and shape the future biodefense research agenda. And I will be there doing a... TWIM with some of the local speakers. You can learn more about this meeting at asm.org slash biodefense2016. I know you were going to put a link in a couple weeks ago about the ASV meeting, but I don't I, think I that didn't happened. I did do it. Um, but I want to remind people, especially since this is already January 8th, and they might be listening to it even later than that, that the abstract deadline for ASV is February 1st. So get on it if you're going to be coming to ASV in Blacksburg, Virginia. Which is yeah. a beautiful place, by the way. Mm-hmm. It is quite nice. All right. Uh, we will do a few emails here. And the first one is from Rohit, who writes, Dear Twivaholics, wish you a very happy 2016. In Twiv365 at T equals 56, 25 minutes. During introduction to the origins of hepatitis A virus paper, Vincent said, quote, This is about hepatitis A virus, which, of course, we have talked about because, as Kathy mentioned, boy, when this is transcribed, it's horrible, isn't it? (laughs) It has a mere mere 121 target sequence in the 5' non-coding region. It's a cellular microRNA, a liver-specific microRNA that's required for its replication. Well, he he listened, unquote. Uh Given that I did my PhD with Stan Lemon and my PhD dissertation was focused exactly on this topic— it is incumbent on me to point out and correct multiple unintentional, thank you, errors in the above statement. <laughs> All errors are unintentional. First, the liver-specific microRNA in question is MIR-122, not 121. Okay. Yeah, you're right. Mm-hmm. Second, MIR-122 is required for replication of hepatitis C virus, not hep A virus. Dear. Yeah. Why did I think that? I'm duh. I'm yeah. so sorry. <laughs> Uh, you know, you, you, you're good to co- correct us. We looked for a mere 122 target site in the hep A genome, but we did not find any. Third, the HCV genome has two, not one, mere 122 binding sites in the 5' prime UTR. Listeners can find more on mere 122 HCV relationship in TWIV 180 and 324. Thank you. Thank you so much for providing great scientific material in TWIV, TWIM, and TWIP. These podcasts help me learn beyond what I would otherwise and gives me company during my experiments and tissue culture. Mm-hmm. Rohit, who I'm sure I have met, is a postdoc in Kartik Chandran's lab at Einstein College of Medicine in the Bronx here. And thank you so much. I apologize for making those mistakes. 
Now, Vincent has to be excused. He has to do 20 push-ups and 10 laps. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I'm so sorry. It's stupid mistakes. Right? Um, Dixon, you could yell at me if you want. No, not at all. You no, could, I'm, you could I'm be prone nasty. to them myself. You so. could be nasty to me. No, I, have, I feel your pain. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, this is my field. I should know this. Hey, you know what? I thought you do own... know it. You just you <laughs> that's it. right. Uh, Kathy, yeah. can you take the next one? Uh, oh no, this should be Rich, right? Because it's about Rich. Uh, right. All right. Go ahead, Rich. Sorry. The- Theodosia writes: Re ebook readers, same here. Rich, <laughs> being able to know how far I was through the book was something I missed when I switched first switched to ebooks. You may want to check out Google Play Books and iBooks if you don't mind buying your books elsewhere. Both of them come with an indicator at the bottom that tells you just that. I like Google Play Books because it is cross-platform, also accessible through the web browser. That's from, uh, we said, uh, Mm. Theo. He signs it, Theo. Mm. Uh, From Frankfurt, Germany. P.S. Keep up the good work, Twivers. You said you didn't like e-book readers, right, Chris? Uh, yeah, I, you know, cause I didn't know how far I was through the book. I'm, I'm, I guess I'm, you know, everything else I've converted entirely over to digital. Uh, but I still like holding a book. Okay. You know? You're not alone on that one. That's fine. Mm-hmm. All right, Kathy. Oh, I scrolled up to try and find something. Okay. Uh, Adam writes, dear masters of the Twixiverse. Long-time listener, first-time emailer. I know Twiv gets its fair share of adoring fans, so I'll keep the praise to a minimum. Needless to say, I love your show. It hits that sweet spot of being accessible to someone who is not an expert in biology, yet still intellectually challenging to the casual science enthusiast. I ran across an article in The New Yorker this week that I thought might make a decent pick of the week. Michael Spector talks about the evolving world of CRISPR techniques, who is involved, and the public's ethical concerns. I know 95% of this material has been covered on the program before, but it looks like a good introduction to this exciting technology. Radiolab also had a recent segment on CRISPR, but I can't recall if it was shared on TWIV already. So he gives the links to both of those, the New Yorker article and the Radiolab story. Your Halloween show also reminded me that I have a very elaborate virology parasite joke. Here's the abbreviated version. Question. Why did Bruce Wayne throw a party at the Hoover Dam? Answer. He heard bats were great reservoir hosts. <laughs> what do you think, Dixon? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's 14C in Peoria, Illinois, after two <laughs> dreary days of 40 mile per hour winds and two inches of rain. Keep up the great work. I must say that my wife subscribes to the New Yorker magazine, and I subscribe to Science Magazine. And on one morning last week, after we returned from our vacation, I picked up the science magazine that had the molecule of the year on the cover, which was, of course, CRISPR-Cas9. And my wife was busy reading that article in New Yorker magazine. Oh, she yeah. says, I know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> so, said, okay, uh, tell me what it is. <laughs> how do they do with science, Dixon? How do they do what with science? How are they with properly portraying science in the New, the New Yorker. The New Yorker. Uh, I asked my wife what she thought the article meant, and she had the gist of it. She had the gist of it. It's a re- gene replacement system for um, modifying the way things look and smell and taste. And, and, and yeah. I, I just think the cartoons are the best. She got, yes. she got her. I do, too. Of course, I read just the cartoons. When she you know, me um, afterwards. Yeah, they, they interview the people who are behind the stories, which is what you should do. And yeah. And compelling yeah, and yeah, so yeah, forth. Yeah. No, it was uh, for the general public. I thought it was a fairly decent article. Raymond writes, Raymond writes, Dear professors, recently I've sent a link as a pick of the week that brings you some trouble that I apologize for. This is a complete image of the Milky Way from Altacama's Desert, which is in Peru. It has been created by assembling 268 images taken in the same five years by astronomers of Ruhr University in Germany and in 194 gigabyte file. Yow. As you have explained, you could actually see the planets around all the other suns that way, I guess. You can move, scroll, zoom in any part. I also missed some instructions. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> well, thanks for uh, explaining that. It's a very fantastic way to look at where we live. And so he also finishes with, let's be careful out there, Hill Street Blues, Phil Esterhouse, quote. And Kathy has an add-in to that one. Would you like to read that? Oh. She's somewhere else sorry. on the page. It was Ramon's uh, yeah, listener pick sorry. in 2000, she's, 365. She's multitasking. 
I'm trying to get that Ngram viewer to work with the adjective noun thing, and I can't get it to work. So oh my. I'll just give up. I meant to mention when Kathy was reading her previous letter there, I just want to <laughs> let people know that if you write a letter that is grammatically incorrect, she will in real time correct it Oh my! as she's reading. She will not say something that's not right. <laughs> I do that. Everyone does that, actually, it turns out. Dixon actually does the opposite. He makes the grammar Well, if, come on, I, I'll make works nice project here. <laughs> I am nice. Don't you, you just tell you how cheery I am. I the next one is from Andre, who writes, hi, I'm a Final year PhD student in Michael Linden and Els Henkert's lab in London and work on gene therapy with uh, AAV vectors, adeno associated virus vectors. I only recently discovered your amazing TWIV podcast and now listen to it every week. <laughs> Thank you very much for doing it. I was wondering if you have recommendations of similar podcasts on neuroscience. Keep up uh. the good work. So I know one because I used to listen to it the Brain Science Podcast by Ginger. Oh, uh, yes. I've listened to some of those. Name, Ginger. Oh, man. Come on. Anyway, you can find it anywhere. Just search for Brain Science Podcast. And she's very good. She's actually an emergency room physician who does this on the side. Ginger Campbell. Ginger Campbell. And she has um, she has guests. She does a lot of things. She's very good at it. And she has a lot of listeners. It's a very popular science podcast. Yeah. Okay, so that's the only one I know of. I'm sure there are others, but that's the one I know. Uh, Rich, can you take... No, 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 no. Rich, I think Vincent should read the next one. Didn't I just read one? Read another one. <laughs> okay. Justin writes, since Vincent loves open source, he oh, sent Oh, is that the, the right one? Oh, I'm sorry. I skipped. I, skipped. Oh, you, I, I know which one you want. Yeah, me. I made a mistake. Read them both. What okay. The <laughs> They're all short. He sends a link to ACS, uh, dives deeper into open access with the debut of ACS Omega. So ACS is doing open access now? A journal? Hmm. Yes. A pay-to-publish, free-to-read, multidisciplinary journal. About that, yeah. Okay, good. Chemical and, and engineering news. Don't you subscribe to? I that, do. I, I'm a member of the ACS, so I, I do get that, and okay. it's a wonderful uh, little vignette. Got it. The next one is from Chaim. Chaim. Yes. He writes, "Hi, Professor Racaniello. He sent it to Twiv. <laughs> That's why I put it here. But I thought you would like. It. I had right. a dream last week that you had won the Nobel Prize, and I had to explain to everyone. I know that your name is pronounced to rhyme with black and yellow. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's but why I'm, I'm, this just goes to show that dreams are 1,000% fantasy. <laughs> <laughs> Happy twiving. All right. Uh, Rich Condit, are you there? I am. Are you able to read Karen's? I, w I would love to because I've been waiting. For, there's two half B okay. letters here. Okay. And, uh, we, we'll do them. I, I have something to say on this. Karen writes, dear esteemed twiv team. After listening to our recent podcast, episode 368, I felt compelled to write in with a few comments and corrections. Here in southeast Pennsylvania, it finally seems like winter with a temperature this evening of 16 Fahrenheit, minus 8 C, and gusty winds. Brr. I am a pediatric infectious disease specialist, so the subject of immunizations always gets my attention. In episode 368, in response to a listener email, you briefly discussed hepatitis B vaccine. Uh, and, uh, that email was about somebody who, uh, talked about pediatricians in her acquaintance, uh, giving the hepatitis B vaccine off schedule specifically rather than giving the first dose at birth, giving it later. And we've right. had some debate on that topic since. Allow me to clarify a few points. The hepatitis B vaccine is recommended for all infants, children, and adolescents through 18 years of age. Ideally, the three-dose series is begun at birth with subsequent doses given between 1 and 2 and 6 to 18 months of age. Most pediatricians follow this schedule. Incidentally, pediatricians provide care for in infants in the newborn nursery, not obstetricians. <laughs> as we had suggested that it was... right. There was a disconnect there, but it's pediatricians who do it. Hep B surface antigen, uh, that's the basically the capsid molecule of the hepatitis B virus, is a marker of acute or chronic infection due to hepatitis B. It is also detectable in those who have been immunized, but only uh, for up to one month following the receipt of the vaccine. That's because the vaccine consists of the hepatitis B virus antigen, and only that that's, that's made by recombinant DNA technology. So it's just a protein. 
antibody to the hepatitis B an, antibody to the hepatitis B surface antigen anti HBS is a serologic marker of immunity after immunization or resolved infection. Infants born to hepatitis surface antigen positive mothers should receive receive the hepatitis B vaccine and hepatitis B immune globulin within 12 hours of birth. Mm. Those born to hepatitis B antigen negative mothers may receive hepatitis B vaccine prior to discharge from the hospital. Uh, so the point is that if the mother uh, has hepatitis B virus surface antigen, that's an indication that she is actually infected. That's right. And since it's uh, very easy to transmit the virus during birth because there's a lot of uh, blood and trauma in, uh, involved, it's very important to give the child uh, of a hepatitis B virus positive mother the vaccine as soon as possible. If they're negative, then she says mothers may receive the Hep B vaccine prior to discharge from the hospital. Nevertheless, it's fairly early in the process. On the subject of newborn care, the eye ointment given to all newborns, <laughs> fin finally referred to as eye goop by pediatric residents manning the newborn nursery, prevents neonatal opth uh, ophthalmia caused by Neisseria gonorrhea, not syphilis infection. Sorry, yeah, right. my Another my mistake error. we made. Yep. Mm. I'd love to hear the TWIV team's thoughts on the use of rapid identification PCR panels in clinical settings. My hospital recently began using a GI PCR panel, which identifies a number of bacteria, viruses, and parasites from stool samples. On the one hand, it's gratifying to know what's causing a kid's diarrhea, but on the other hand, I now find myself having to spend a good deal of time interpreting the test results for other practitioners. <laughs> for instance, we just had a two-year-old who returned from a trip to Southeast Asia and tested positive mm -hmm. for two viruses, astrovirus and sap uh, sapovirus, and three bacteria, entero. Aggregative e, coli, aggregative e. coli, enteropathogenic E. coli, and Campylobacter. Goodness. Treatment is recommended for only one of the five, Campylobacter, although any one of them or all of them might cause his symptoms. That's true. Maybe it's a case of more information not necessarily <laughs> being a good thing. It will be interesting to look at our data and see if there are any demographic or seasonal trends, and it is useful for infection control purposes. But beyond that, I'm a bit skeptical. I also listen to TWIM and TWIP and enjoy all three podcasts I have recommended them to many colleagues, trainees, and students. Keep up the great work. Here's a suggestion. Maybe you should consider adding a clinician to the discussions on uh, TWIM and TWIV as you've done for <laughs> TWIP with Daniel Griffin. Clinical case scenarios really help bring the bench and bedside closer together. Clinicians do have a lot to offer, especially us infectious disease docs. Thanks again for the great discussions. Keep the podcast coming. Karen. So... Uh, let me uh, go back and make some comments one bit at a time here, or at least one comment. The Hep B surface antigen, or the Hep B vaccine thing. Uh, I have not tried to verify this or look it up somewhere in my intellectual history. I think I understand correctly that when the Hep B uh, vaccine was originally introduced, it is, as we'll see in a subsequent letter, critical to administer this vaccine as soon as possible, right at birth, if the mother is hepatitis B virus positive. In other words, if the infant is at risk, okay? It's very important to uh, administer the vaccine right away. And my understanding is that initially, they kind of made this, tried to make this distinction between hepatitis B virus positive and negative mothers in making the decision as to how to schedule uh, the vaccine delivery because if it's a hepatitis B virus negative mother and the general environment has a low risk environment, it, you know, theoretically doesn't, you know, really cause any problem to uh, delay the vaccine. But my understanding is that on a population-wide basis, implementing that strategy of selective vaccination was not very effective, not that as effective. That is true for many, many vaccines. When you start subdividing the population and saying, 
okay, this subset should get it, this subset, eh, get it if you feel like it. Right. Uh, it always complicates things. It always reduces vaccination rates right. below what you want. And so for that reason, they went to the recommendation of just vaccinate everybody at birth, and that'll cover it. And statistically, that did the trick. Right. The hepatitis B ver- uh, burden uh, decreased. And I want to point out that this is another one of these vaccines, like the HPV vaccine, where all we're talking about is a protein. That has never seen virus, okay? It is just the surface uh, antigen of the virus that's made by recombinant DNA technology, so there's no virus anywhere. In terms of safety, there's virtually no risk whatsoever. So there's absolutely no downside to giving this uh, vaccination at birth, unless you want to quibble about the kid getting one more prick at uh, birth, but you know, I think relative to the trauma of birth to start with and all the other things going on, <laughs> right. uh, that's uh, pretty trivial uh, when you consider uh, population-wise the consequences of not doing the, uh, the the immunization. So, personally, I support the recommendation and I don't see any reason to change it of giving the vaccine at birth. Here's yeah. where it would be nice to have a clinician because <clears throat> I want to know If, like, rabies vaccine, when you're giving a vaccine and the immunoglobulin to the hepatitis B positive uh, mother-born children, um, do you give that in two different sites? Is there a risk of that? Oh, right. Um, Uh, Right. Interesting. Right. And I I imagine it's just easy enough to just give it in two different sites, and that's two needle sticks, but there you go. So the, 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 I would love to have a clinician here. We, on TWIP, we do it because Daniel Griffin is here, right? Um, we would have to have it regularly because we never know when we're going to get these letters right. that are clinically related. And, you know, a weekly clinician is is not happening, right? Unless we have four different people who could rotate. That's true, know. right. But maybe Karen, Karen sounds very smart. You interested? Sure. She Once a smart. month? Once a month? <laughs> so I want to add something to the discussion, and that is I know the person who discovered the hepatitis B surface antigen. You can't. He's dead. Yeah, I know. His, his name is Blumberg, <laughs> and he was a graduate of our medical school. And because he went on a fourth-year medical elective to Columbia, he got interested in hepatitis and later on described this antigen first as the Australia antigen, and then later on it evolved into, of course, the surface antigen coat for uh, hepatitis B. And that vaccine also prevents cancer. I must say, I must say, Dixon. It was fantastic. um, So the fact that this was actually a viral antigen was not clear to him. No, no, it It wasn't. It was pointed out by Alfred Prince. Yeah. of the Blood Center here in New York, who did not participate I knew him too, yes. in the Nobel Prize, unfortunately. Right. And this is a subject of much discussion. Yep. Uh, with respect to the PCR uh, testing, you know, for the viruses, it doesn't do you much good because you can't treat any of them at this point, right. right? And I can't comment on the bacterial identification. I think you would probably know better than that. But remember, in each case, you're detecting nucleic acid, not right. not right. infectious virus, not right. uh live bacteria. So. Well, and I will say the the good thing about detecting viruses, even though you're not going to be able to treat any of them, um, is that it can reduce overuse of antibiotics. Mm-hmm. That's right. So if you get, uh, and yes, these tests are going to, they're going to be like a lot of medical tests. You're going to get answers that are not necessarily a home run on any particular cause in all cases. But if you do get a case where this is clearly a viral condition, you know, we know that this is what is going on, we're not going to give antibiotics. Right. And you can then, you you then have a test result and you can point to that when you're talking to the patient or the parents of the patient or whatever uh, and hopefully persuade them that the kid doesn't or that they yeah, don't need good antibiotics. That's so I think, good it, point. I think it can help in that respect. So this child, I assume, had uh, gastroenteritis or diarrhea, right? <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. And Time so astrovirus like and sapoviruses are both are viruses associated with diarrheas. Right. Mm-hmm. Right? So it can't be, though, right? Yep. Right. So in this case, they treated... No. Yep. Sure. But, yes, because there's something in the test that. Yeah, yeah. But if it were just, reading, if so. there were just, you know, astro and sapovirus, and he had diarrhea, then they would say, okay, it's viral. We can't do anything. Right. So, uh, so my uh, thoughts on the use of rapid identification of PCR panels in clinical settings is, I don't know. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, I, it, a- I, I, you know, I, I, I don't see a downside to having all the information. 
okay? And just over time, you're going to have to learn how to deal with it. Yeah, exactly. It's a it's another type of medical test that is going to give results that people are not necessarily expecting, and they're going to need to, um, the clinicians are going to need to come around to understand what those results mean and what they uh-huh. don't mean. I think the it's going to ep- take the, experience. I think the epidemiological value is great. As Just yes. what I was going to oh, say. Enormous. Exactly. Wonderful. Right. Say. So, yeah. for example, my postdoc just sent me a paper today that I haven't had time to really look at, but it's a case uh, report of somebody who was supposedly co-infected with dengue, chikungunya, and Zika virus. Oh, oh my but gosh. But they only did PCR for Zika. Mm-hmm. For dengue and chick, they uh, had antibody uh, evidence. So, you know, the question is, Yo. we know that those antibodies for dengue can be somewhat cross-reactive. So, you know, why didn't they just do PCR for all three? And we don't know that. That's just Maybe a simple case report. Maybe the PCR came back but, negative. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, um, I, I think, yeah, unless it, you know, is a virus for which there is an antiviral or if for some reason rabies turned up in some kind of PCR test, then where you could give the, prof- the prophylactic, I mean, yeah after the fact vaccine um yeah then there's not really uh, anything other than maybe what alan is suggesting i got a response from paul dupre about rinderpest aha uh-huh. it is now a select agent and will go the way oh. of polio virus mm. ah there you go makes sense it does you know i i wrote an article uh, about you know having to destroy my stocks and my feelings about that I want to tell you one person's response, which I thought was pretty funny. This person said, it's okay. We can make more if we ever need it. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Which is absolutely true. That is completely true. Uh, You know, so good at extincting the things that we do need. And it's incredible how we can't get rid of the things that we uh, find harmful. Well, and that that was one thing as I was reading your your write-up on your blog. And I, and I thought, oh, wait, but if you get rid of the, of the type 2 vaccine strain, then you, oh, right, never mind. That's not going to be a problem. You can just make more. Yes, that's right. Well, remember, some labs will keep them. Only and, some and, labs. Yeah. And, yeah. Or uh, they'll forget they had wants, them. Or they'll anybody who right. wants it can download the sequence and synthesize right. it. And it they'll turn up in an NIH freezer. All right. Let's do one more because this is about Hep B also. And it's, we're up to Kathy. Okay. Uh, I lost track again. So I thought Keith. I saw end of email. Keith. Oh, it's Keith. Okay. Dear esteemed doctors, I want to add a little something in regards to your discretion regarding hepatitis B vaccine at birth. The push for the hep B vaccine at birth is correlated with the effect of hepatitis B on a neonate versus an adult. I had researched several years back, and my understanding is essentially about 5% of adults progress to develop chronic infection, whereas in neonates, the number is about 90%. A much smaller but real number will go on to develop occasionally fulminant hepatitis and some, prog- some progress to cirrhosis and hepatocellular carcinoma. The easiest way to prevent hepatitis B in the newborn is vaccine starting at birth. If we know for a fact that the mother is hepatitis B free and immune, then I believe a very reasonable argument could be made for delaying vaccine initiation. I think the value of an excellent physician is that they individualize the care as it applies to your particular situation, and they don't apply some sort of broad, safe brush that works well for the population as a whole, but perhaps not for you. A quick excerpt I plucked from Up to Date. The infection rate among exposed infants with infected mothers who do not receive any form of prophylaxis is as high as 90%. Hmm. Clinical manifestations in course, newborn infants with HBV infection rarely so show clinical or biochemical signs of disease at birth. Affected newborns remain asymptomatic and develop chronic antigenemia with mild and often persistent liver enzyme elevations beginning at two to six months of age, hmm. an immune tolerant phase. Prevention. Universal hepatitis B virus immunization is recommended for all infants. The optimal intervals and need for HBIG are determined by the mother's hepatitis B surface antigen status and the infant's birth weight. Management. There is no specific therapy for infants with acute HBV infection since antiviral therapies have not been tested in this age group. In the rare infant with fulminant hepatitis B, off-label use of these compounds, nucleoside analogs, may be considered. Mm. I love your shows, especially TWIP with the case studies. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Keith. Yep. Okay. 
Thank you. And uh, Dixon, you need to leave, right? Well, soon at uh, four, but I just oh, wanted to say, nice to him. <laughs> I just wanted <laughs> oh, to say that we crossed a milestone in terms of H uh, uh, Twip yesterday. We had our hundredth hundredth episode, so Yay. we're we're catching up. But I don't think we'll ever match Twiv. <laughs> well, unless we stop Twiv. Yeah, well, that's it's not I, happening. No, and nor will we stop Twip. All right, so let's, let's do your pick, Dixon, so you can leave. Sure, right? well, it's just, <laughs> it's so um, relevant to our discussion today that uh, I'm surprised I picked it. Uh, <laughs> it's called <laughs> Unfilled Vials. It's a feature article in Science Magazine that just came out this issue. And it's uh, a subtitle is Scientifically Feasible Vaccines Against Major Diseases Are Stalled for Lack of Funds. Gee, how surprising. Science names... 10 Top Candidates That Need a Boost, and it's written by John Cohn, and I, I don't know if you know him, Alan, but he's a good writer, as he's are writer. you, and uh, in <laughs> fact, I picked up your article on uh, subcellular particles, and it was uh, fascinating and fun to read, so that was a little shout out there, but let me just read it to you, the top 10 uh, agents that are identified as in need of a vaccine that have had lots of research done on it, but have yet to appear as a, a, an absolute vaccine that you can take out into the market and use. They begin with the Ebola, Sudan strain of Ebola, then chikungunya, then MERS, then loss of fever, then Marburg, then a bacteria, paratyphoid fever, and then, of all things, this big giant worm appears, <laughs> schistosomiasis, <laughs> uh, rift valley fever, and then SARS, and then finally another worm, hookworm. So of the top 10, two turn out to be helminths, and the rest are all virus. Well, not all the rest, but most of the rest are viruses, and one is a bacteria. And they're very. all of these are very close or have actually passed several trials, but are waiting for their funding before you can actually uh, do work on them. And then it has a very nice summary at the end of the article on at least the viral aspects and in the hookworm, and it throws in West Nile as well, <coughs> which it didn't include in these lists, as the summary of, of what the status is right now, how many people die, for instance, from it, and uh, where they're found, and what the status of the vaccine development is. So I think it's a very good article for people interested in knowing um, why we don't have more vaccines on the market and what might be done about it. You can always write your congressman and petition for f bigger funding levels. And by the way, the NIH uh, budget got a big boost just recently too, right? Yeah, but Dixon, yeah, go on. companies make vaccines, and if there's no market for them, they're not going to make them. Well, there is compassionate development of vaccines, isn't there, through a WHO program, I thought? Well, you know, the, the Ebola vaccines were yeah. rushed out there yeah. because there was a big outbreak. But exactly. But we have to wait for that. That's the point. Yeah, well, right. right. Well, companies make vaccines, but they do it, um, it partly. If there's a market, then yes, the company will do it itself. But this yeah. is one of those examples of yeah. a market failure where there are a lot of vaccines that would be very useful, but they're not going to be profitable necessarily. And there are multiple mechanisms that government can employ to to yeah. help get around that. And they already have. I mean, yeah. we've got we've got smallpox vaccines in development and at least in principle nobody should need those. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and a lot of these infections occur in countries that can't afford them. Right. Has to be a way to deal with that. There has to be a way. There are. There are it, ways there are ways of dealing with eventually that. Eventually they'll come here. <laughs> you can fund you can fund development directly uh, or do other things along those lines that are called push mechanisms. Who can fund it? The government. Right. That's in the so end. You provide, you provide government funding to <laughs> yeah. companies to develop vaccines. All right, right. So okay. So that's a push mechanism. There are also pull mechanisms, <clears throat> where you can guarantee uh, government purchases of a certain amount of a vaccine once one is developed and shown to be efficacious. And that's the smallpox program. The government says, "Look, yeah. we're going to buy a stockpile of this." Yeah. And so companies will then get involved in that because they know they'll be able to sell it. Yeah. Yeah. Rich Condit. Yes. Uh, the BARDA program. Where does the money for BARDA? They do a lot of vaccine purchasing, right? Where does their money uh, come from? It's uh, it's NIH. So Your taxes. Do they? It is it is a it is a uh, I believe a um, special congressionally mandated uh, pot of money. Okay. That's administered by NIH. So it's separate from NIAID, right? I be, I. 
I can't be sure of that. Yeah, because that's I always the know. problem. You know, you get NIH has a certain amount, and they have to partition it in a certain way. And if they're going to give uh, X money to vaccines, it's going to come out of somewhere else, and it shouldn't. Right, it's, it's shouldn't. a zero-sum game problem. It should it should come out of, if it's going to come out of any government budget, it should probably come out of the defense budget, because they've got plenty. <laughs> here, yes, here. Exactly. Uh, and that's, again, that's an example of stuff that wouldn't be built if the government wasn't saying, we'll buy it. Yeah. So this is clearly a way to get things made. At any rate, Goodbye. I do have to go. Thank you, and Dixon. So happy New Year, everybody. I'll see Bye-bye. you next Take time. Take care, Dixon. Yep. Bye. Yep. Bye, Dixon. Bye-bye. Bye. Kathy, do you have to go? No. Okay. Uh, Alan Dove, what do you have? Uh, I have a book that I read just a little while ago. Um, it's called Skyfaring, A Journey with a Pilot. And this is... Um, the author is Mark Van Honecker, <clears throat> who um, it'll be fairly obvious why why I picked up the book and <laughs> came across it. Uh, I am a pilot, and it turns out um, I discovered after I started reading the book that Van Honecker is actually originally from Western Massachusetts. Mm. But I got it um, off a couple of recommendations. Uh, this fellow is is a really really gifted writer, um, and. And quite a thinker. So, if you imagine what would have happened if, uh, if um, I don't know, um, Thoreau had become a first officer in 747s, you might get a book like this. <laughs> um, and and it, that's what this guy does. He's a first officer in 747s based in London. I'm not sure what airline, but... Um, and so, he flies around the world in big jets and... Uh, and looks down on the world and across at the clouds and up at the sky and thinks about the technology that's put these people in the stratosphere and the whole relationship between people and technology and the planet and each other. And it's just really, really neat. Did you read the book or the Kindle version? Uh, I read this as a Kindle version. So, Alan, is it hard to fly a 747? I haven't done it. What do you think? What do you think? What do you think? Well, I've heard I've heard that it's not inherently any more difficult than flying a Cessna 152, um, but there's a lot more technology going on, and uh, there's a lot more training involved to, to so get to that. The, so the size doesn't matter. You don't feel that it's a heavy thing, right? Right. the The controls are all um, are are boosted so that you've got yeah. <clears throat> you know you're not you're not actually heaving this multi ton jet around the sky with your arms. You're um, you're using control inputs that are being handled hydraulically so uh, the reason i ask is i have a friend who i don't know maybe five years ago claims he got to sit in the cockpit during landing of a 747 Mm -hmm. right and he said the pilot basically was it looked like he was struggling with a pig you know he got up he put this big pillow under his chair so he could see out the window and he's wrestling with the controls and i just find that hard to believe that's very hard to believe yeah Uh, unless that was a very low budget airline um they particularly in the airline business there should not be anything dramatic about landings yeah I would about think. any other part of the flight uh, it's it, it should be a very ritualized professionalized activity well and it, to me it's hard to believe that he was allowed to go into the cockpit but that too i i know you're not supposed to but he said and i don't know if he's repeated this story many times he's uh he's, he can be honest i don't know <laughs> <laughs> so but uh it was a British airline, he said, so I don't know. The reviews on this, the first couple that I looked at uh, when I saw Alan's pick are pretty strong, positive reviews also. So it sounds like a really good book. It is neat. So you can change careers. <laughs> I, wanna, I, I missed the exit for this one by about 20 years, um, okay. but uh, yes. He did this when he was young, right? He did this, yes. He he had worked as a business consultant for a few years after college and had always dreamed of being a, a pilot and then finally acted on that. But I think he did that when he was in his 20s. Okay, cool. Sounds great. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. My uh, Safari does not like Google Docs. It keeps spinning the wheel. Oh. So I just shifted to Chrome, which is much better. Rich, what do you have for us? Uh, I have a, it actually shows up in several sites, but to me, for me, it's a link to Facebook. It's a Ah. a NASA Solar Dynamics Observatory UV Pictures of the Sun. That's (laughs) my uh, own uh, title for this thing. It's in a, uh, there is a group called Milky Way Scientists 
who have a presence on Facebook and Twitter and Vimeo and elsewhere, a bunch of different uh, social media that post pictures of uh, stuff, okay? Uh, <laughs> you know, mostly space stuff. Uh, these are pictures that were taken by a NASA um, uh, satellite observatory called the Solar Dynamics Observatory, which was launched in 2010 uh, that was launched for the purpose of understanding more about the sun. And these are animated uh, clips of pictures of the sun uh, done with a UV filter. So you're looking at UV. And I picked them simply because they're gorgeous. They they're are. They're just yeah. astonishing. They're yeah. really good. I just think okay. the stuff coming off the surface of the sun is amazing. Yeah, yeah. it really is amazing. Uh, but if you if you um, are interested and dig into it uh, a little further, uh, you can look up on Wik Wikipedia the history of this solar dynamics uh, satellite, which is interesting in its own right, and also other links by these uh, Milky Way scientists, which uh, are very nice. I guess that's one place where there are no viruses. The sun? On the sun. <laughs> I would assume so. No life. Yeah. Uh, it, well, how are you going to find out? Can't You can't get close enough. You burn up, yeah. right? Right. How close can you get? Do you know? I don't want to know. You know Pro uh, probably, know. Not, probably not even as close as Mercury or Venus. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Rich, I asked you once if you'd go to Mars, you know, to, to look for viruses. You said yes, but I guess you don't want to go to the sun, huh? No, I don't want to go to the sun. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's pretty cool. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Kathy, Kathy, what do you have? Well, I want to segue from riches. So talking about things that come from the sun, there's also the solar wind, which is charged particles, mostly electrons, protons, and alpha particles. And when they intersect with our Earth's magnetic field, it can react in auroras. Mm -hmm. And auroras are these beautiful light shows, and uh, they can be of different colors depending on which uh, particles in the solar wind um, uh, ionize and uh, so then which light gets emitted, it can be various colors. So it can, it's very beautiful. Um, that's a long segue into my pick, which is maybe not so scientific, but they're Aurora's bike lights. Mm. <laughs> and these are lights that uh, you just, they charge by USB and then you put them into the spokes of your bike wheels, turn them on, and they cycle through a variety of colors, blue, yellow, green, uh, magenta. And they serve as a really nice way to uh, have it identify your bike at night um, through something uh, moving. So I've always had a bike leg light so that when my leg goes up and down, there's something moving because oftentimes that's easier for drivers to see than just a static light. And I recently thought I lost my leg light and I investigated something else. And so I got some of these bike lights uh, and they're just really cool. And there's a Vimeo that you can watch. If you ride fast enough, then it just looks like a solid circle. Mm. Um, most of the time, I don't think I'm going to be riding fast enough, but I got some more for Christmas. So now I have two on each wheel. Um, one of my bike colleagues was worried that, oh, wouldn't that unbalance your wheels? And I said that the way I bike, it was not going to happen. <laughs> but but I do like the idea of having two of them. And they, they just snap on really easily. And if you have to park your bike outside, you could easily um, pull them off. So it's cool. Thought cool. For those people in this season of the year, it's mostly only people in Rich's neck of the woods who might be riding at night, but they're worth checking out. But if you're riding at night in the northern uh, areas, then you definitely need lights on your bike. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. But the weather might be bad enough that you're yes. just not doing that. Oh, it's cool. Uh, my pick is a essay in the New York Times by Rebecca Skloot, the author of The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. Many of you should know that book. We've picked it here before. It's called Your Cells, Their Research, Your Permission. And it's all about as we move into uh, new technologies, that the you know the medical consent doesn't always work. You know, if you want to sequence everyone's genome, maybe at some point you can identify who it is. And so there are some changes afoot in this. Uh, the U.S. is proposing revisions to the federal policy for protection 
of human subjects, also known as the common rule, and that governs research on people, tissues, and genetic material. And uh, it basically, it goes through the story, what's going on here, relates it to the HeLa cell story, which was a long time ago, of course, and brings up the sequencing of the HeLa genome, which was just released without any consultation uh, with the family. And of course, you can identify certain things in the sequence. And so changes have to be made to deal with this. Her, her upshot is basically that most people are okay with sharing their tissues as long as you ask them and tell them what's going to happen with it. And I, and I think that is absolutely right. And that's how it should work. You can have all my tissues once I'm dead, of course, and do what you want with them. But um, I think it's a nice essay, and she's a good writer. So hmm? check that out. We have a couple of listener picks. Uh, Rebecca Skloop, by the way, lives in Chicago, and she's doing a sabbatical in Berkeley at the J School, the journalism school. And uh, I have a friend out there, uh, Dave Tuller, who has been writing on my blog recently. And uh, so I said, hey, do you know that Rebecca's coming out there? And he said, yeah, I, I, we talked about you recently. Good. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, Kevin writes, dear Twivisphere, I'm a relatively new listener, having only been listening for about a year now. But I noticed that you regularly discuss how to best convince people to vaccinate. In addition to Twiv, I also entertain myself with late night comedy. And I noticed that John Oliver's Last Week Tonight uses a comedic platform to bring serious issues to a, a large number of viewers. Perhaps if the scientific community pushed television shows to normalize the idea of vaccination, Grey's Anatomy and House MD come to mind. A large group of American population might be more amenable to vaccines. Here's my listener's pick with Oliver discussing poor regulation of nutritional supplements. It's two degrees centigrade in New York, but of course you already knew that. Stay warm. <laughs> John yeah. Oliver is fun. Well, uh, Alan, you could do the comedy, you know. Uh, not as well as this guy. Yeah, so we we have had a few things in the past. Uh, who are those two comedians? Penn and Teller? Penn and yeah. Teller. I think they've done a, a pro-vax uh, they did. thing as yeah. well. Yes. And I agree, because people love popular actors, right, and comedians. Sure. And they listen to them, and we know that can be negative. We know the Jenny McCarthy effect as well. But you're right, it's a good idea. All right, the next one is from Jim, our friend in Virginia. Episode 386 at this link is an hour-long video with nice, nice graphics and lots of QA. Previously, I've only seen brief descriptions and single photos of various accelerator facilities. This is the first time I've seen an in-depth visit. Don't know where it might fit as a suggestion in one of your podcasts, but wanted to point it out in case it's of interest. This is a tour of a, an Australian synchrotron. Cool. And it just reminds me of threading the needle. <laughs> you know, many people don't get to go inside these places, and right. so these these people did, and so it's pretty cool. So I thought I uh, I visited the Brookhaven Labs yeah. uh, synchrotron, and it just is mind boggling. Yeah, mind boggling. Yeah, I'm sure. You also visited the Needle. That's pretty cool. That's mind boggling as well. And that is going to open up this year at some point. Well, they're having a symposium. Coming. Yeah, in September, and uh, yeah. Alan and I will be there. Nice. And um, supposedly, Alan, we're going to, well, maybe I shouldn't say this on the air, but something cool is happening. I know that yes. I know that David Quammen is speaking at this. Um, They've got a bunch of big names. And they have to a lot of, this lot of big names, and then there's you and I. Right. <laughs> this is actually from a, a blog, and it's a post number 836. Right. Wow. So it's worth checking out. A lot of posts. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, thanks guys for that. And this is Twiv. You can find it at iTunes and at, I'm going to say, microbe.tv slash Twiv. You should go there now and check that out. It's where all our shows are re residing at microbe.tv. And we love getting your questions and comments. We absolutely love them. We love hearing your stories about how you found us and what you get from it. Send them to Twiv at microbe.tv. Dixon de Palmier has left, but... I think I forgot to thank him, didn't I? Or maybe I did. I think you thanked him. Anyway, mm -hmm. he's uh, here at Columbia University, and he's back. Kathy Spindler is at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks. This is a lot of fun. And it's still raining, not yet snowing. It's going to switch to snow at some point? Uh, or some of that wintry mix stuff like Alan was talking about. Did you, did you ride your bike today? No. I did see somebody riding this morning, and I thought, oh, I should have done that. And I thought, oh, no, no, it's supposed no. to rain. I'm glad I didn't. <laughs> Rich Condit is back in Gainesville, Florida. Thank you, Rich. You're quite welcome. Always a good time. 
And you had a great trip, I guess, right? I did. It was unreal. Made, did you make was, eggs Benedict on New Year's Day? I did. Or New Year's Eve. And uh, we had, uh, we had, you know, my daughters uh, brought their families out. So we had 10 of us together for a while. We went, actually, one of the really best days was uh, a day when I just got to ski all over this mountain with my daughters. It was just fantastic. It was great. When is your next trip? Um, the uh, next trip planned is uh, we're going to go up to all my trips have to do with family so far. We're just going to go to Boston and uh, play grandma and grandpa while um, one of my daughters and her husband uh, take off to India for a couple of weeks. Oh, cool. uh, but, you know, in the first six months of retirement, I've been gone for four of the six months. <laughs> Good job. So it, uh, it feels like, uh, you know, right now is probably the beginning of retirement. Because I don't think I, we've been home for longer than three weeks at a stretch. Um, uh, so now we'll be, we don't have any plans until March. So we'll see what this retirement thing is really like. Well, I uh, hope you get your router issues sorted out. Uh, yeah. So, yes, we can talk about that off air. All right. Alan Dove is at turbidplaque.com. You can also find him on Twitter. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. And I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>